Thank you for attending the Brevard County Commission meeting on this, the 11th day of July, which is the 192nd day of the year, which for those of you who are math wizards have already figured out that we only have 173 days left. Right? Everybody knew that. On the lighter side of our agenda, we start with some useless but perhaps interesting information. And the first one will be a jiffy. Everybody's heard of a jiffy, correct? How many people, and this is a rhetorical question, you don't have to raise your hands, but how many people actually have ever thought about if Jiffy is a real unit in time? I never did, but I happened to notice recently that it in fact is a unit of time and it's one one hundredth of a second. So if somebody tells you they'll be over in a Jiffy, ain't happening because they, they, they can't even blink in a hundredth of a second. You also may be interested to know that on this day, back in 1962, the very first transatlantic TV transmission took place. Something that we take for granted today, but that was a big deal back then. Because not even uh, sporting events on the West Coast were broadcast on the East Coast, or vice versa. And if it was, it was very seldom, like a World Series or something like that. We never, ever saw a live transmission from another continent. But that all changed 55 years ago today, in 1962. And that, my friends, is your lighthearted look at some useless but interesting information on this day, the 11th day of July. And now we will start with the more serious business at hand for our beloved Brevard County. We will start with an invocation. And we all stand, please. Let us pray. Almighty God and giver of all authority, we thank you for this day for the opportunity to serve our citizens in Brevard County. And Lord, I ask that you would lead our commissioners as they lead our community. Would you give them wisdom from on high? May they execute justice and equity for every citizen, tempered with mercy. May partisanship give way to statesmanship. Yes. And may mutual respect rule the day. Finally, we ask for good health, blessings, and protection to be given to our commissioners as they serve our community. And I ask these things in the name of my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Can I introduce them? Sure. That Pastor Steve Goodner from Rocket Town Church in Titusville, Florida. And, sir, it's an honor to have you here, and thank you for that prayer. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Please follow me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, we have some old business to conduct. Uh, first, some paperwork. We need uh, a motion for approval of the minutes of April 25th, 2017, May 9th, 2017, May 23rd, 2017, regular minutes, April 27th, 2017, May 9th, 2017, and May 11th, 2017, which are special meeting minutes, and May 4th, 2017, zoning meeting minutes. So moved. We have a motion to approve. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Anyone wish to vote no? It passes 4-0. We'll now move into resolutions and presentations. The fir first resolution is proclaiming the month of July 17, 2017 as Parks and Recreation Month. And I will read that. Mary Ellen. Okay, let me read this, and then the floor will be yours. Whereas U.S. representatives have designated July as Parks and Recreation Month, and this marks the 32nd annual celebration, and whereas the Brevard County Parks and Recreation Department is dedicated to enhancing the quality of life for residents and visitors through recreation programming, leisure activities, and conservation efforts, and whereas parks and recreation plays a vital role in creating active and healthy communities by introducing persons with special needs to physical activity, connecting children with nature, and providing facilities for people of all ages to maintain fitness, aid in the prevention of chronic disease, and remain socially interactive. And whereas parks and recreation programs provide youth with a safe refuge and place to play, helping to reduce at-risk behavior, build self-esteem, and create positive life experiences. And whereas parks and recreation opportunities, facilities, and open spaces increase Brevard's economic prosperity 
by enhancing the desirability of communities as locations for tourism, business, and residential settings. And whereas the Brevard County Parks and Recreation Department contributes to maintaining the quality of life in our community by providing a positive impact on the social, economic, health, and environmental quality of Brevard County. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Brevard County Board of County Commissioners does hereby proclaim the month of July 2017 as Parks and Recreation Month and encourages residents and visitors to get their play on. <laughs> Done, ordered, and adopted this 11th day of July 2017. I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 4-0. You have your proclamation. What would you like to say? Good evening, Commissioners. Brevard's Parks and Recreation are the key to connecting citizens with our natural and historic treasures. The Parks and Recreation Department manages 121 developed parks, three campgrounds, three nature centers, three education centers, 44 beach access sites, 10 school athletic sites, and more than 16,500 acres of environmentally endangered lands. Within our community, we offer a variety of programs and leisure services. During the fiscal year of 1670, the following parks and recreation saw an average attendance of over 121,000 at the campgrounds, over 160,000 at our community centers, 780,000, give or take, at our athletic fields, summer camps have about 50,000 children enrolled, youth programs and special events, or almost about 14,000, and Eels had about 52,000 visitors to their centers. With the hard work and dedication of our staff, the department has fulfilled the mission that you just saw on our slides by managing the resources our parks offer to the fullest by providing a setting for social enrichment where visitors and citizens alike have the opportunity to connect through group activities, classes, and special events. I'd like to say thank you to our Parks and Rec staff, Sean, Jill, Jesse, Savannah, and Melissa for the presentation and the lovely take-home gifts that we will be presenting you. And our kids are here to get your play on. <laughs> Ready? Technical difficulty. No, I'm okay. Thank you. We appreciate. Get your play on.
Okay, the next resolution that we have is a res resolution recognizing Judge Majid for the service to the people of Brevard County and honoring him on the occasion of his retirement. Judge Majid, would you come up forward, please? And you said you wanted to bring Judge Harris up here, too? And while, he's, while he's on his way up, let me read this. Whereas Judge Majid was appointed to County Court Judge 18th Judicial Circuit in April 1993 and retired on April on December 31st, 2016. He's, he was Brevard County's longest serving county judge. And whereas Judge Majid held numerous judicial leadership positions including President, Florida Conference of County Court Judges, Brevard County Administrative Judge, and Chairman, Brevard County Canvassing Board. He received the Space Coast Public Safety Lifetime Achievement Award, and whereas Judge Majid has a reputation for treating all parties in the courtroom with respect, exercising patience and understanding, and used his court proceedings as an opportunity to educate offenders about the process and their constitutional rights. Over the years, he has received a multitude of letters from defendants thanking him for his intervention in their lives. And whereas Judge Majid's legacy extends far beyond the court system, his patriotism and love of country has made him a favorite speaker in Brevard County and throughout the state of Florida. He believes public service is a privilege and considers it part of his civic duty to talk to his fellow citizens about the judicial system, our rights and responsibilities as U.S. citizens, and to share his deep and abiding respect for the U.S. Constitution. And whereas throughout his career, Judge Majid has remained steadfast in his commitment to public safety, protecting citizens' rights, and celebrating the ideals that make us uniquely American. Now therefore, be it resolved that the Brevard County Board of County Commissioners does hereby recognize Judge Ali B. A. B. Majid for distinguished service to the people of the Brevard County and honors him on the occasion of his retirement. Done, ordered, and adopted in regular session this 11th day of July 2017. I so move. Second. We have a motion and a second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 4-0. Congratulations, sir. Thank you, sir. Chairman, members of the commission, uh, thank you very much for giving me a few moments here. I know you've got a lengthy agenda, so I'll be very, very brief. Uh, my name is John Harris. I have the privilege of serving as the chief judge here in the 18th Circuit. And on behalf of the 43 judges in Brevard and Seminole County, we all want to thank you very much for this resolution, uh, recognizing the tremendous career and achievements of our good friend, Judge A.B. Majid. So again, on behalf of all the judges, thank you all very much. Absolutely. Very well, few. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> you ask a lawyer to be brief, you know what that means. I want to thank the county commission for being so gracious and kind and recognizing me. Um, I came to America as a 22-year-old student, and um, I came uh, with a suitcase and two empty pockets. And I want to tell you, after 24 years on the bench, I still have two empty pockets. <laughs> 
Um, I've had some very interesting cases, and I thought um, to make it a little bit light, I had a case one time where um, this gentleman, um, he came before me, and after the case went on, he got married. I, I performed a, his wedding ceremony in my courtroom, and no sooner than that, I got a letter from a member of the public. They said, Judge Majid, you have to be one of the toughest judges in the entire state of Florida. A gentleman comes to you on a minor crime, and you give him a life sentence. <laughs> I want to thank you all very much. In my wildest dream, I could not dream that I'd come to America as a son of an immigrant and become an attorney and become a judge. And I am extremely grateful for this nation and for all the citizens of Brevard County and this county commission. I want to close with one note that I have, uh, as president of the judges, I've had an opportunity to interact with judges throughout the state of Florida. And I want to assure each and every one of you sitting here and in this room that Brevard County has the best group of judges anywhere in the state of Florida. I Thank agree. you all very much. God bless you. God bless you. Okay, and our next resolution is a re resolution from Commissioner Tobias requesting the United States Congress to refrain from extending statehood to the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is my first resolution here uh, before the uh, board, so I appreciate your indulgence. I will go ahead and read it. Whereas the people of Puerto Rico have contributed greatly to the heritage and security of the nation. Whereas the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico is $123 billion in debt, including $74 billion uh, debt burden and 49 pension burden, which is approximately 1.57% funded. Whereas Puerto Rico's debt crisis in large part a result of socializing private industry. Whereas Puerto Rico Electric Power Authority alone has incurred more than $9 billion of debt, while at the same time becoming, quote, archaic, according to Puerto Rico's May 5th, 2017 bankruptcy filing in the U.S. District Court for the District Court of Puerto Rico, whereas Puerto Rico's debt as a percentage of aggregate income was 100.7 percent as of 2012, compared to the U.S. average of 16.8 percent. Whereas the Puerto Rican uh, Oversight Management and uh, Economic Stability Act, PROMISA, was passed into federal law in June of 2016 with the support of government of Puerto Rico in an attempt to allow Puerto Rico to independently become sustainable. Whereas Puerto Rico used the power granted to them under PROMISA to declare bankruptcy in federal court, and the case remains active. Whereas the burden placed on federal tax payers to remedy the decades of mismanagement and socialization by the government of Puerto Rico would be untenable, whereas the uh, June 11, 2017 referendum on Puerto Rico's statehood had participation rate of only 23 percent, the lowest turnout of any election in Puerto Rico since 1967. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County uh, does hereby request the United States Congress refrain from extending statehood to the Commonwealth of Puerto Rico, done, ordered, and adopted in the regular session this 11th day of July 2017. Do you make a motion? Uh, are there are there uh, cards that you want to take? Or? Yeah. What, how how would you like to handle that? Well, you can you can make the motion, and then we'll we'll listen to um, we'll see if you have a second, and then we'll listen to speaker speakers. Okay. Uh, make a motion to adopt the resolution. Do I hear a second? I don't hear a second. Motion fails, but we have a, a lot of people here. We have a lot of people here that have something to say. So, uh, George Perez, Diamas. Yeah, uh, good evening. Uh, to the members of the County Commission and all present, I'm here today as a private citizen, taxpayer, and productive member of our county. My name is Dr. Jorge Perez de Armas, hematology oncologist, Army Major Retired, veteran of the Iraq War resident in Brevard County, Titusville area, and I'm a proud American citizen born in Puerto Rico. Mr. Tobia, you intend to pass a resolution on the political status of Puerto Rico. This resolution is inflammatory, misleading, and disrespectful to the people of Puerto Rico. As you know, 
Eh, Puerto Rico is a Commonwealth of the United States of America. In correct terms, a non-incorporated territory, or as I call, a colony of the United States. We had not achieved a full self-government. Puerto Ricans have been citizens of the United States since the year 1917. We have participated in every major military conflict since then, proudly defending our country with our fellow American <coughs> citizens of the mainland. Despite that, we do, not, we do not fully participate in electing the leaders and the commanders-in-chief of our national government that control our affairs. Uh, Mr. Tobia, I believe you are misinformed about the contribution of the people of Puerto Rico to the U.S. and to the state of Florida. Puerto Ricans pay social security taxes, Medicare, as well as other taxes. We contribute per capita more manpower to our military than any other state of the Union. We subsidize the marine merchant of the United States in the name of national defense through the Cabotage Law, John Act of 1920, making our product 40% more expensive than in the mainland, a huge hidden tax on the people of Puerto Rico. Mr. Tobida, you mentioned that making Puerto Rico a state is a bad deal for the continental U.S., that we are indebted and poor. Well, you are mis misinformed, and your comments are misleading. Puerto Rico has a GDP higher than state, 13th state of the Union, a per capita GDP higher than Spain. Our debt to GDP just barely reached 60%, while our national debt is above 80%. Therefore, in any case, before lecturing Puerto Rico about our, our debt, let's put our house in order first. Mr. Diemos, you have 30 seconds. Let me find, I, I, I couldn't finish my, my comment, but let me find at this. I have to, something to say to, to Mr. Tobia. In this time of political incorrect, incorrectness and tough politics, starting from our, our president, I'm going to tell you what I think of you. Leader Tobia, you're a leader politician. You're not a, you're not a congressman. Nobody asked for your opinion on this issue, and I know what you're up to. You want to draw national attention of the symbolic resolution of one country of the state of Florida to further your career through this resolution. Let me give you an advice. The, poli the political status of Puerto Rico is highly divisive. Sir, issue. You're, you're out of time. I invite the member of the commission to vote not in this resolution. I invite you to my home to a picnic to teach you about Puerto Rico. I will tell you the story of the Pitiri and the Warawau. We're small, we are fighters. As once a governor of Puerto Rico, the Honorable Pedro Rosillo said, don't push it. Thank you. Catherine Haynes. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Katherine Haynes and I live in Melbourne. I'd like to address the resolution before the commission today regarding statehood of Puerto Rico. It appears that at least one member of our commission is interested in significantly broadening the scope of the commission's mission beyond traditional business. It seems that this commission must have much more time at its disposal than I ever imagined. In that vein, I'd like the commission to adopt resolutions and entertain agenda items addressing the following issues that fall equally in the commission's scope. Benefits of adopting a vegan lifestyle, increasing length length of professional baseball games, appropriate length of a teenager's skirt in a private school setting, cell phones, are they safe? Should college football expand the postseason playoffs to eight get teams? What's the appropriate amount of television for a teenager to watch? Is some of the stuff in professional wrestling real or is it just totally fake? <clears throat> what happened with Paris Hilton? Why is she no longer in the spotlight? Should we revert to the gold standard and tie the dollar's valuation to gold? Did researchers actually find a mummified three-fingered alien in Peru, as was recently reported in the National Enquirer? Let me stop for a moment. I'm assuming that the commission will not allow me to extend my time indefinitely because I have a lengthy list of suggestions to share. So please limit your limited time and resources on issues you have direct control over and undeniably pertinent to the residents of Brevard. Thank you.
Peter Vivaldi. Good evening, uh, commissioners, and I want to thank all of you who are here uh, for responding to my email. I live in Orlando. I live in your neighboring Orange County, uh, but it was important enough for me to come out here and talk about the resolution for Puerto Rico. Um, Puerto Rico is a territory of the U.S., and U.S. Congress is responsible for Puerto Rico, and as it is for all other of the 50 states. Puerto Rico is not asking or requesting a bailout. Some of the language in this resolution speaking about socialization, Puerto Rico is not a socialized government. Talking about the burden on taxpayers, uh, we're not asking for a bailout. There's no burden that the United States would have to uh, assume because we became a state. Puerto Rico has to work and they are working through the PROMESA bill. So we know right now that we have some issues and for me, I don't want to take more time because I appreciate the vote and, and where it didn't go. But I do want to say that this resolution sounds a lot like what I heard about a month ago on the floor of the Congress through Congressman, I call him Socialist Congressman Luis Gutierrez. A lot of the issues that were brought up in this resolution, Mr. Gutierrez, who we have known as a socialist and lives in this country free and wide, wants to see Puerto Rico under bondage and never free. And for me to hear a person who calls himself a Republican like I am, a Republican, and talk in the same, using the same sentences that a socialist would use is very offensive. So we are here just to thank you and to let you know that we know there are probably mosquito problems in Brevard. There are probably other things that you want to be dealing with, and Puerto Rico is not one of them. So thank you so much for your time. Samuel Lopez. Good evening, Commissioners, Chairman Scott Knox, County Attorney, and the Interim City Manager. My name is Samuel Lopez. I'm President of United Third Bridge, Incorporated, a civil rights organization in Brevard County. And I want to thank all our friends and everyone who came down here who's going to be speaking behind me. And I'm going to cut mine short because um, Dennis is going to talk quite a bit about um, about Puerto Rico. Um, when I sent out my press release to Florida today and to the neighboring uh, news people, my concern was that, um, that this fell on discrimination. It's, that's basically where it is. And I want to thank all the commissioners for uh, basically letting this die, uh, because that's where it was supposed to go. And, um, and the rest of the people that are here and the surrounding counties, we're organizing a picket line at Valencia College where you work, and we're going to let everybody there know what type of a person you are and what, is, what kind of a human being you are. Um, you know, um, I, buried, I buried my brother. Three, three, I have four brothers, three, two in the Navy and one in the Army, and they served this country. And for you to come up and start rattling off all that garbage that you, that you actually spoke today, without even, you had an opportunity to talk to every, you had an opportunity to come to talk to us. We have an office uh, here in Brevard County. We have the chamber office and we have our UTB office. You could have sat down with us and asked and, and, and just brought forward and said, hey, I'm thinking of doing this. What, you know, what is your thinking? Um, very simple, and maybe you could have gotten a better response, and we could have worked with you, and maybe you could have understood us. Um, you know, when people serve this country and they die for this country, that's saying a lot because that's the ultimate. My brother gave the ultimate for this country. So, and I thank you very much for letting it die. Colonel Dennis Freitas. Hi, I'm Colonel Dennis Freitas, U.S. Army, retired. As an American veteran who has been inducted into the Florida Veterans of Fame by the Florida governor, 
As former trustee of Valencia College, appointed by Governor Jeb Bush and confirmed by the Florida Senate twice, also as a professor at the University of Puerto Rico, professor of military science, I had a thousand cadets and I commissioned officers for the United States Army. As a commander of infantry, special forces and airborne, and now I am a community servant leader. I respectfully say, and with respect to you, Commissioner Tobia, millions of loyal U.S. citizens from the U.S. territory of Puerto Rico and others here are on a quest for institutional equality. We ask you support, not hinder our fight for justice. And I was going to say please vote no, but it's already been voted no. But I, I will say a little bit about Puerto Rico. First, the numbers you mentioned there are one-sided. They, they don't explain that PROMESA was imposed on Puerto Rico. There were even the, the current governor of Puerto Rico, who is pro-statehood, Ricardo Rosselló, the president of the Senate elected by the people, uh, Rivera Schatz, and the resident commissioner, a Republican, elected by the people, are pro-statehood. They now have a Tennessee plan, and they're sending three ex-governors, a resident commissioner, to fight for statehood because Puerto Rico is in a straitjacket. Everything that Puerto Rico does is based on the status because it's under the territorial clause. It's not a commonwealth. That doesn't exist. That's a political di distorted word. So those numbers, by the way, also the cash flow between Puerto Rico and the United States, the United States has, uh, all, the, all the federal government has a net gain of over $45 billion. Puerto Rico has a net loss. Puerto Rico imports over 80 percent of, of things from the United States. It's one of the best trading partners of the United States, creating hundreds of thousands of jobs. I can go on, but my time is, is being limited. We have American veterans dying on the battlefield to include the Borinqueneers, many living in this district that couldn't vote for their president, did not have just representation under the Congress that determines their destiny, don't have all the benefits, don't have seconds. parity in laws, and other things. Also, it is the duty of every uh, border to vote, and, and here there are many instances of where many elections in off years have very low turnout. So in closing, Puerto Rico's economic, fiscal, and status crisis must be dealt with and resolved concurrently. We hope you will stand with patriots of true grid for equal treatment under just laws uh, and not stand for this discriminating uh, resolution. Uh, remember, we must cry out for reason and justice and let it prevail as we work together for the good of all, family, community, USA, and humanity. Thank you very much. And I, I, I also, with respect, I respect you as, as a commissioner. And I know you have your position, but I'm prepared to meet with you and give you some other facts that I have studied for three years. And I didn't say that Ronald Reagan was for statehood for Puerto Rico. Thank you. <clears throat> Colonel, thank you for your service. Thank you, sir. Anthony Suarez. Thank you, Commissioners. Um, thank you for giving me the opportunity. I'd like to introduce myself. Uh, my name is Anthony Suarez. I am a former state representative representing District 35 in Orlando, Florida. I am currently the president of the Puerto Rican Bar Association of the State of Florida. I am an adjunct professor of law at Barry University School of Law, and I served in this United States Army as a captain in the United States Military Intelligence Corps in, uh, early in my life. So I'm a practicing attorney of 40 years in the, in the United States, both admitted in several jurisdictions. But I really want to thank you for giving us this opportunity, and I specifically want to thank Commissioner Sobeya for giving us this opportunity. Because while some of your critics may be saying this is really, uh, you know, not a federal, this is a federal issue, not a local issue, I disagree. Because uh, every, the fact that Puerto Rico is a colony of the United States and 118 years being a colony being under that state is an American issue. It, re it affects everybody. And the fact that it is against the, the very essence of the United States Constitution to maintain people 
where they cannot vote for their representatives, where they can go to Afghanistan and die for Afghanistan people so they could vote, but they cannot sell vote. I think that it is contrary to the spirit of the American Constitution. And I make reference to the, the question about the debts being, uh, being one of the reasons why Puerto Rico should not be admitted, but I, I point out to you that that debt is owed by Americans. The 121 billion is owned by American corporations, two American pensioners, two Amer it is an American problem. Whether Puerto Rico becomes a state or not, it is an American problem. And the fact that Mer the Puerto Rico, if it doesn't become a state, still happens to be Americans will be serving the military, as myself, as Colonel Freitas, and they will go fly around the world to protect American interests, whether they become a state or not, seems to be against American uh, values. And while you make reference to the 20, 21% or 23%, you know over 500,000 Puerto Ricans voted for statehood. And if they don't become a state, those 500,000 people will be looking for a state to move to. Something where 1.1 million Puerto Ricans already have chosen Florida, those Puerto Ricans who voted for statehood and don't get statehood will eventually be looking for a place that has sunshine. They'll be looking for a place that has beaches. Yeah, 30 seconds. <laughs> and they will have a lot of, of, uh, of, of, this will be a very valuable place for them to go. So, Your Honor, I, Your Honor, I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, I, uh, that's about the nicest thing anybody's ever said to me. <laughs> were it not for your resolution, this media would not be here. This is getting wide coverage in Puerto Rico and around the, the country it will be. You gave us this opportunity to bring forth the issue of Puerto Rico. Thank you very much. Captain Suarez, thank you for your service. Richard Charbonneau. Richard Charbonneau, Satellite Beach. Um, I don't really know what was in John's mind uh, but when he proposed this, but I'm going to take a shot at it. Um, recently, you know, Greece was in uh, financial strait, and Germany had to bail you know, Greece out, and, and they, they had to go into debt. Um, I'm assuming that John's thinking about the amount of debt that Puerto Rico would put on the United States if, we, if, you, if the uh, Puerto Rico became part of the United States. And, you know, the same can be said, it's much smaller, but Guam is, you know, severely in debt also. So we should, you know, we should, should we take Guam and make Guam a state in the United States also? Because they're in, you know, severe debt. Um, I, I, I think that uh, I did some figures and it, it'll probably cost us about a quarter of a trillion dollars and do we have the money? You know, that's the thing. I'm not anti-Puerto Rican, that's for sure. And I happen to be a disabled vet, and I happen to be a part Native American. And, you know, while I'm at it, um, I don't see anybody talking about doing anything special for Native Americans. You know, there's 590 uh, reservations in the United States. Uh, that Native Americans live uh, 10 years less lifespan than, than the, the people of the United States. And, uh, you know, my ancestors were here 15,000 years ago, if you believe that, uh, oh. surely before any of you. And uh, oh, that's funny. That's funny. That's funny. Sir, will you continue? Oh, okay. Uh, but we were here 15,000 years ago. And, uh, you know, we, we should be recognized also. And we have poverty right here, you know, within the, the, the Native American population. So I, I, I don't think, I, I know John pretty well, and I don't think he's anti-Hispanic or anti-Puerto Rican. I think he's just concerned about the amount of debt that would, in, would incur. If he tells me otherwise, then, you know, I'll believe otherwise. But I just see this as a, uh, as a, as a you know, a tremendous debt uh, situation. But the same thing if we took on Guam. 
You know, Guam should be a state also. You have 30 seconds. That's fine. And, um, you know, like Margaret Thatcher said, you know, eventually you run out of money. And, uh, you know, we're running out of money. I mean, right now we're just borrowing Chinese, you know, money, and we don't really have enough money. Half the people pay taxes, half the people don't. I, I pay tax times 10. Thank you. Sarah Ann Conkling. I'll be very brief because I really appreciate um, what didn't happen today and, and um, the fact that there wasn't a second. I'm here basically um, out of friendship for a couple of um, people who, with families in Puerto Rico who, who um, are first generation American citizens but have loved ones still in Puerto Rico who can't be here today. And I just want us to be um, really careful about two things. One is that this commission um, stick to the things that concerned directly the citizens of Brevard County. I think you've taken a stand to do that today, and thank you very much. And second of all, that we not look at any kind of resolution which has either overtly or covertly any kind of um, air of racism about it or, or singling out of any ethnic group of people for any kind of discriminatory purpose. So I really appreciate the commission um, taking the high road here and, and sticking to the um, issues that most directly affect the citizens of our county and, and staying within the confines of the government, which you do well so much of the time. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Charlie Graham. Uh, Charlie Graham from uh, Satellite Beach. Um, first of all, I'd like to do something that hasn't happened much today. I'd like to thank Commissioner uh, Tobia. Um, sent him an email, and uh, despite his direct opposition to my position, I received an email in a timely manner, and uh, very much respect that. That's a, a sign of good governance. Now, um, Quickly moving on to, uh, I had a, uh, the opportunity to uh, be selected for jury duty for Judge Majid, and at that, Judge Majid gave uh, all prospective jurors a speech on civic duty, as I'm sure he did many, many times. And because of that, in part, um, that's why I'm here. It inspired me enough that you have to be a citizen and you have to get up front. Um, we have many more important issues than what's happening in Puerto Rico. The fact that they voted 97% to become a state, is that's the, what they'd like to do, but that's what, not what I see our commission needing to do. Um, and I'd like to waive the rest of my time, and if uh, Judge Majid would like to give a little bit of that uh, civic speech, I think it'd be awesome. Thank you very much. Randy Foster. Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm, as you can tell, uh, I'm not Puerto Rican, but I love Puerto Rican people. And I have a cousin, family member, that is Puerto Rican. And I also spent uh, a couple of years as a U.S. Marshal on the island of Puerto Rican fighting crime. So I think I'm qualified to speak uh, on this issue. Um, this is the county commission. This is not the House of, U.S. House of Representatives. And I would like for my commissioner, uh, Tobiah, and my other commissioners to focus on our county issues. We have road problems. We have transportation problems. And we have other issues in emergency management. And that's what we should be focusing on. Uh, when you bring up an issue that's in the national uh, arena, such as statehood, that was already decided by the people of Puerto Rico. And they supported it. And I support them on that. To live in an island like I did in the Virgin Islands, when I moved my residence there because of employment, I couldn't vote for the President of the United States. 
And all my life, I'm a, I'm a citizen that served in the military. I couldn't vote for the President of the United States. The people in Puerto Rico cannot vote for the President of the United States. They don't have no representation. That's why statehood is so important to bring them in the fold. They sacrificed on the battlefield. Their family members lost their life in defense of this country. When we serve in the military, we serve to protect all citizens. We, serve, we raise our hand to support the Constitution. That's why statehood is so important. And if we don't have statehood for Puerto Rico, to me, that's just a modern day form of slavery. That's the way I look at it. So um, I'm not here to roast uh, John Tobias, but I wish he would focus more and bring to light issues in the county. We have to get this county moving forward. And I, and I urge you commissioners to do that. Thank you. Thank you for your service, Mr. Foster. Alberto Esperon. Hi, my name is Alberto Esperon. I live in Merritt Island, District 2, I believe. And um, there's not a lot that I could say about Puerto Rico that hasn't been said here before. I am proud to be a conservative American. And all I could say right now is that with all the political climate that we live in today, and this president and our party saying that all Americans are first, and we are bringing a resolution like this, putting down and picking and choosing which Americans to help is wrong. We should look into this problem and solve the problem to 3.5 million Americans in Puerto Rico that are loose, they don't have the same rights and everything that we enjoy here in the main line. Thank you very much, and that's all I gotta say. Okay, that's the end of our cards. We'll move on to the consent agenda. And I have a number of cards for the consent agenda, so let's do those. Two A seven, Douglas Hoyt. Are we pulling these ones, sir? No, I just want to hear what these folks have to say. If, they, if you guys want to pull them afterwards, then okay. we'll pull them. Okay. Actually, I'm here for questions only, uh, I believe. I'll be glad to answer any. Uh, okay. So if, if anybody here has any questions, we'll, we'll get you up here. Thank, thank you, sir. Thank you. It was 2A7. It was 2A7, yes. And 2C2. Mr. Chairman, that was... 2D7 that Mr. Uh, Hoyt was here on. Two, wait a minute. 2A7. I'm sorry. What appears on the agenda is 2D7. He may have missed. Oh, okay. 2D7. Gotcha. Okay. You got that? Okay. 2D7. Okay, the next would be 2C2, Pat O'Neill. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. I'm Pat O'Neill with the City of Rockledge, and I live in Rockledge. Uh, on 2C2, it has to deal with the Emergency Operations Center, the design portion of it. Uh, I'm concerned that if any delay happens, the county's going to encumber some significant additional cost over and above where we are. Uh, the design needs to be completed, submitted, and the paperwork done no later than May 2018. Uh, I'm hoping we have no delay in the program and we can go forward with this. I don't know how many of y'all have been to the Emergency Operations Center, and not just going there, but going there when it's fully active. Uh, I've spent many, many nights on the floor. That was the bedding. If you've been in the kitchen that feeds the people there, uh, your house has a bigger kitchen. Yeah. 
and there could be 150 or 200 people in there. We had to bring an outside caterer in when they could come in. I'm referring back to the storms of 04. Uh, at the storms in 04, we lost power, which is really interesting when that's the central hub for the, the county's emergency response and the air conditioning goes out. And if you've been in the emergency operations center, there's no windows. That's kind of like the design process, so the wind doesn't knock them in. Uh, I'll tell you that if you can go ahead with the process, do the design, uh, you can put it on a lot of different pieces of property, especially if you're looking at the structure and you come with a defined footprint. You can put it wherever you end up putting it. Uh, I will tell you that the Space Coast League of Cities last year gave to Tallahassee our legislative priorities. All the 16 cities within this county. The Emergency Operations Center rebuild, redo, new structure was on our list. We only had four things on the list when we presented to the <coughs> legislative delegation. So I, I urge you to continue on with this. If we have a major disaster and the way it looks, the ocean's warm already, it, it's not a matter of if, it's just a matter of when. Uh, not only our preparation during the storm, but our recovery after the storm, that facility is critical to us getting back on our feet. Without it, we're not. Thank you. Sarah Ann Conkling. <coughs> it's 2C2. Thank you, Commissioners. I'd also like to speak in favor of um, anything we can do to expedite the needs of the Emergency Operations Center. I've also toured it. Um, I think every citizen should. It's a, um, amazing the amount of activity that comes out of that building, and especially um, when it's activated for emergencies. And I have been uh, in favor for a long time of getting them everything they need, including comfortable accommodations for the people who are literally stuck there during an emergency. We don't have good places for them to sleep. We don't have enough places places for them to go to the bathroom and we don't have enough adequate facilities to feed them. So thank you for putting this on the agenda and for expediting it. I appreciate it. Josh Matt, uh, 2C6. Okay. 2C6, Josh Madsen. Good evening, Commissioners, citizens of Brevard County. Things to cover real quick. I just want to <coughs> cover the same thing they're saying, the Emergency <coughs> Management Center. This is one of the vital things that we need for operations, just like you see the conditions they're in. Many of the conditions that our fire stations are in right now also have mold. We have issues with them, and these guys are in that 24 hours a day on shifts. All right? We've seen a lot of cuts. We're very concerned. We stand here with the citizens of Brevard County, also all the employees of Brevard County. We need to stop the cuts. Revenue is our issue. You need to be responsible commissioners, and we need to start moving forward in a progressive f push to move forward in this county. Just to let the citizens know, in the last four years, actually three years, you have 41% less paramedics responding to your calls. We have changed our staffing. Citizens don't know this, but this is all because of revenue and cuts. 41%. If things are not changed by next year, you'll have 60% less paramedics responding to your calls. That's a concern to myself, concern to my family, and concern to all my friends that live in Brevard County. I pray and I urge you to please begin to move forward. All right? These are issues that you as commissioners can address. I served in Iraq 2003 to 2004. Over 50% of the men I served with in the Florida National Guard and the Puerto Rican National Guard were from Puerto Rico. All right? So I served over there. It's time to put ourselves, as we do, I urge you as commissioners, put yourselves before your constituents. Put them ahead of yourselves, not your next elected position. It is time that you stand up for the people, do what's right, and don't do what's popular and what's going to put you back in your seat two, three years from now. Do what's going to help Brevard. Move us forward, please. We were losing too many employees. You'll have 90 brand new firefighter EMTs in the streets by next year. That's 90 brand new because we cannot keep people. They're not paramedics, these are EMTs. A paramedic is an extension of an ER physician. We work under their protocols. We can start IVs. We push pharmaceutical drugs on you to save your life. We can intubate you. We use our cardiac monitors to save your life. An EMT can hand me those things when I ask for it, and he can drive me to the hospital. 
So when we start cutting our paramedics, you are cutting the amount of services that are going to your citizens. I urge you as citizens to reach out to your commissioners, and commissioners, please listen to your citizens. Do what's right. Do what's going to protect them. Pay our employees, all county employees, not just firefighters. Keep them here. All right? They have an investment in this county if you take care of them. If you don't take care of them, they're going to leave, and I can't blame them. They have to be able to raise their family. They have to be able to live in the county they serve. And right seconds. now, they cannot afford to live in the county. You can go 30 minutes in either direction, Central Florida, South Florida, and make enough money to support their families. Please help our employees do the same. Thank you. Again, 2C6, Christine Madsen. Guy. Hi, Commissioners. Hi, citizens of Brevard County. My name is Christine Matson. I'm an 18 year paramedic firefighter with Brevard County Fire Rescue. I take pride in my career. I provide, to the best of my ability, a favorable outcome to all my patients. Though, due to staffing cuts of qualified medics decided upon you, the Commissioners, this has made, this has become and over the expectation, and over the top expectation, and all the efforts to save a few dollars. I know when I'm asked to testify, did I provide the best possible care for a patient, or could there have been anything else that I could have done for a better favorable outcome? My answer will be yes. I do believe I did provide the best care, but due to the limited number of qualified personnel, my patient's chances for survival were greatly decreased. Commissioners, if you were asked the same question, what would your answer be? Have you held up your commitment to, every, to your very citizens that have elected you for your position? As for me, saving a life is more important than saving a few extra dollars, since my family and friends live in Brevard. I believe that Brevard residents would feel the same, and they too would be disappointed in the entrusted commissioners that they have instead focused on the actions of saving a few dollars securing their seats for next year's election, and avoided to inform them that they are no longer receiving the same highest level of emergency care services they were promised. Thank you for your time. Life is worth more than a few dollars. Have a nice evening. Okay, moving to 2D6. Resolution approving retrocession and authorizing staff to work with Air Force in developing intergovernmental cooperation. Patrick Ganusik. Okay. So, having heard all the comments, does anyone wish to pull any of the consent agenda? Yes, Mr. Chair. Uh, 2C3 and 2D9. 2C3 and 2D9. Yes, sir. Any others? Okay, I'd like to entertain a motion to accept the rest of the consent agenda. So moved. We have a motion to accept. Second. We have a second. All those in favor, vote yes. 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 Opposed? Passes 4-0. Okay, so 2C3. Mr. Tobias, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, my office uh, caught a contract um, issue and uh, thankfully we, we brought it before the Commission. This was a uh, failure uh, to uh, execute or, or a breach of contract um, and it looks as though the County Attorney's Office is asking for approval to go ahead with this breach of contract and that's a good thing and I want to thank the hardworking people uh, in my office for catching this. My question and the direction I think I made from the board is what protocols are we putting in place so the uh, 
county attorney's office is working with the various departments, so it's incumbent upon our nine attorneys to catch these breaches of contract instead of the county commission offices, many that don't have attorneys uh, in them. So I don't know if that question uh, would go to the county attorney or what would be the solid waste department. I just want to make sure that a situation like this is caught much sooner and by the uh, professionals that uh, are highly qualified and, and uh, um, know these type of uh, situations. So, so that's the question. What protocols do we now have in place? Mr. Rodriguez, would you like to field that first? We have changed several things occurring in the department. Um, and like, I can only speak for the department. I can't speak for, for countywide. But we are in the, um, whenever these contracts come up, we're having uh, what we call project meetings and staff meetings every staff meetings every three months and project meetings about once a month in which we can keep track of this kind of situation and we can bring it to the county attorney's attention a lot sooner than what we did before. Thank you. In, in fairness, that, that you didn't bring it. Uh, my my office no, brought no, that I'm to the county's that attorney. We it. Just, I'm, but I'm, I'm just glad. Saying, I'm glad. Uh, I'm and, just and thank you very in much. The uh, as as long as as long as protocols are put in place, so we're able to uh, to to catch this uh, before it gets to our county commission offices. Again, I want to thank uh, Billy in my office for 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 making this catch. But uh, you know, I certainly would like it handled uh, prior to you know making an agenda item. And I thank you for working reactively instead of maybe proactively to make sure this type of situation doesn't happen uh, in the future. Mr. Knox, do you have any comments? Yeah, I'm just going to say that we uh, don't monitor contracts in our office. That's this function of each department. They have somebody assigned to do that. And uh, if they spot problems or if they have issues that pop up as a legal issue, uh, like failure to perform under a contract like this one was, they come to us and that's when we talk about it. If I might speak. Mr. Abate. Um, one thing that we did and we began doing within the last two months is um, every um, Wednesday after board meetings, we are having a meeting with all our directors to uh, debrief on what happened and what we did right after that particular meeting, Commissioner Tobiah was address the issue not only with the directors but we do have uh, the county attorney's office uh, participate in those meetings and each department has a particular county attorney that is assigned to them and we re-emphasize the importance of that dialogue that needs to be happening um, contemporaneous with whenever one of these issues arise and that was brought up at that particular meeting and will be re-emphasized re as we move forward at other meetings as well. Mr. Barfield. Um, another point to that, do we in the, in the RFP process, RFQ process, all the way through the actual contract, do we have clauses in there for liquidated damages, all of them? Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm talking all departments, because, you know, as people were bidding this, they needed to bid that in their cost. They had to bid that liability. And also, the point is, if there there be people that drop out because of that, too, it helps us with the quality of the people we get, or the companies we get. That would be a question, I think, for Mr. Abate. Uh, what we do have is... Both risk management and the county attorney's office review those contracts, and we will be certain that um, those provisions are reviewed as part of that contract review before um, they are uh, enabled to be processed further. So we will uh, be certain to make sure that where that's possible that we, we have that negotiated in the contracts. Okay, then, Mr. Tobai, would you like to make a motion to accept 2C3? And before that, I would like to uh, thank the interim county manager for uh, jumping on that and, and spearheading so we don't run across that as an issue. Um, I think, you know, we have a change in leadership at the top, and that may be uh, all we needed. And I appreciate, uh, you know, as you handle a myriad of issues, this just being one, 
that it looks like you've uh, put in protocols to make sure that the professionals that do work here uh, are aware of issues that, that do arise and can take care of them so we can hold uh, you know, the taxpayers uh, harmless and, I and make a motion to accept uh, 2C3. Second. We have a motion to accept 2C3 and a second. Anyone wish to vote no? It passes 4-0. Mr. Tobiah, 2D9. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, when we were dealing with interlocal agreements, um, MIRA was a little bit different. Uh, as we all uh, uh, were told, it being a, uh, uh, an auspice of, of county government. So this was coming before us to uh, have the interim county manager discuss this with uh, the Myra, the, uh, not an interlocal agreement, but I guess an agreement with ourselves. And uh, I think it was just a formality with the exact same um, uh, items that, that we talked about in the past, uh, maybe a sooner sunset and all that, uh, that that we discussed. There was just one more uh, doing a little bit of an inspection of the Myra. My request is that when we uh, provide funds to Myra um, through negotiation, I would um, think that individuals with criminal records should be ineligible for, for county funds. Some Myra grantees who received over $22,000 of county funds, let me read off a list of some of the crimes that they have committed here in Brevard County and across our wonderful state. Use or possession of drug paraphernalia, possession of oxycodone, per, uh, possession of oxycotton, felony battery, violation of state probation, disorderly intoxication, DUI, and operating a vehicle without a driver's license. I guess that one's not too bad, but uh, certainly uh, felony battery. These individuals that apply for grants uh, through Myra, I, I would request that we do background checks and we make sure that we're not using uh, uh, hard-earned dollars uh, on on people that have made terrible decisions in the past. So, so I, I'm bringing that to the board that that. Uh, when you enter into that into quasi interlocal agreement, that we add that to uh, the Myra one as well. Mr. Tobias, can I ask you some of those folks that you're saying that they received monies from Myra? Uh, a total of twenty two thousand eight hundred sixteen dollars and eighteen. What cents. were what were the things that they were supposed to be accomplishing for Myra? Do you know that? I can give you I can give you uh, what exactly. Uh, the projects were in total, and I can get you the individuals, but the reality of the situation is I don't think public money should be going to people that have been uh, found guilty of felony battery regardless of what their intent was. But it would be more than willing to find out, you know, I, I have I'm it just, here, I'm where that money went where, particular. Did, did they apply for monies from Myra to fix sidewalks to what kind of blight were they working on? What was their projects? I, I, I can, you know, I okay. would be more than willing to match it up. Okay. I just took all the people just that received grants and uh, the businesses and then crossed them with a basic, uh, you know, criminal background check that everyone can do online, double checking the names, making sure that mm -hmm. not only the name but the address was correct and thinking that probably we have better uses of dollars to hand, no matter what. And, and you know, they may be a fulfilled what, what they promised, but I just don't think that that's the wisest use of, um, uh, tax dollars to go to people well, that made first these decisions. Well, first blush, I agree with you, except that as I think about it, you know, we do have an, uh, a criminal law s system in our country that people do make mistakes, and when they make mistakes, they pay their penalty, and when they get back out on the street, how long do we continue to punish them? Well, that 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 that's coming up before the voters if you know the the uh those folks gather enough signatures of whether or not we offer people that have been convic convicted of, fe of felony the ability to vote again so mm -hmm. you know i would encourage you to go out and sign that petition i won't be signing that petition but i encourage you to go out and do that but uh, either way i think it is uh you know i i hope they've mended their ways but i just don't think that uh 
these tax dollars should go to the, the, these individuals. And that, that is my request. If, you, if, if you're not on board with their request, it's duly noted. Know. I understand what, you, what you're saying and where you're coming from. But I can tell you that having been in business for some 40 years, I had more than my share of people that needed a second chance. And some of the very best employees that I had had done some pretty despicable things in their past. But I always felt that I will give you an opportunity to show that you've learned from your mistakes. And uh, for me, people started with a clean slate. And when they, and they did, there were some that, that weren't worthy of trust. I, they, there were, but there were some that were very, very trustworthy. I smell smoke. I do too, I do too. And we just lost our air conditioner, so I'm guessing that's what the smoke is. As long as we don't see flames. Well, we got a great picture tonight. <laughs> How about if we take a five-minute break? How about if we take a five-minute break? I, I, you didn't get a second on that. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we'll reconvene this meeting. We were in discussion regarding Consent Agenda 2, 2D9, Clarification of Board Direction for Merritt Island Redevelopment Agency. And Mr. Tobias, did you have the floor? Uh, and that break afforded uh, me the opportunity. Uh, all, all of those grants, the $22,816.18, were either to A, facade projects or uh, sign projects. So those were the, the two places. I'd be more than willing to, to give you each uh, uh, conviction here with which project it went to, but those were the two projects, facades as well as signs. Well, unless one question. of the other commissioners wants to know, I, I particularly don't. I just wanted to get an idea, but having thought about it, um, I agree with what I said the, the, the second time. We can't punish people forever. And if these people are legitimate and they have licenses to do this work, I don't think there's any reason in the world that we should deny them the opportunity to, to do their trade and make a living. But that's my, my opinion. Any Just other thoughts? Commissioner add, Barfield? Sorry, out of clarity, the, these weren't the workers. These were the business owners right. that received this, okay. this not, not the actual okay. workers. Well, again, the same thing. Okay. You know, I'm not going to deny them an opportunity to make a living. Mr. Barfield. Uh, first, I'd like to ask a county attorney what are the implications with the statute requirements and all that? If, if you, I know it's putting you on the spot, if you could research all that and get back to us on that. Because sure. it also affects the other CRAs for their cities, too. Yeah, okay, we can do that. So I think that's important to know the rules. Any other comments? So, moving forward, what do we want to do with most? I make a motion that we uh, go ahead and uh, accept this direction. Do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to clarify, for clarification of uh, Merritt Island Development Agency. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Passes 3-1. We're in public comments. Okay, we'll move on to public comments. I have a card from John Mandala. State your name, please. John Mandala, I'm the Brevard County Reentry Task Force Co-Chair. And one of the things I would like to bring to your attention is Right now, the policy, or maybe it's not a written policy, but one of the problems we're having is people are being released 
from the county jail, sometimes at 10 o'clock at night, 12 o'clock at night, 2 o'clock in the morning. They do not have an ID card in some instances. There is no bus stop. SCAT does not go, have a bus stop at the jail. They have no transportation out of there at that time of the morning. SCAT doesn't run. And so I hear people making comments at the Brevard County Task Force reentry on what we are doing. Public defenders saying it's ridiculous to allow people out at this time of the night. It's ridiculous when you can't get a bank account, you can't get a job, you can't go to a hospital to have no ID. There should be some mechanism. If the sheriff doesn't have the money to give people an ID card, then the state now is giving people ID cards, and there some, should be some cooperation between the state. If we're really concerned about public safety, which we're supposed to be, then these people should have ID cards. There's no question about it. And so I think it's something that we should really look into and find out what the problem is, whether it needs to be a, an emergency fund for just those people that don't have ID cards. But I want to commend Commissioner Smith. You know, if we hold people forever responsible for the mistakes that they make, none of us would be free. Last year and for the last 10 years, over 500,000 people have been released from the prisons in the United States. 60% of them go back. We're doing something wrong. We need to start realizing we have 60 million people coming to our airport every year. Crime's rampant. What are we doing? We're right on that main highway going to the beach. We really have to be concerned about giving people ID cards when they get out of our county jail. We don't have a reentry program. Nobody has anything. You let a guy out tomorrow, he doesn't have a place to live, he doesn't have a job. You have 16 Thank you. That's enough. You have another card here for a different subject. Would you like to address the board? Yes, I would. You're wearing two Again. hats. You're wearing two hats tonight. I'm wearing many more than that. Again, my name is John Mandala. Um, I've been very involved with the river cleanup. I came out with a new thing just today. Transparency, building confidence through transparency, cleaning up the Indian River Lagoon, one of our most valuable natural resources. I called 14 different state and federal agencies and asked one question. Who is testing water for people to swim in our Indian River Lagoon? The answer is nobody. They're testing it for clams. Clams are different than people. 25 years ago, there were clams, oysters, and grass in that Indian River. You could make a living. There are no clams left. There are no oysters left. There is no grass left. And yet, I live on a street, and I've been fighting the county for the last year, trying to get the runoff water from approximately 150 homes that is going directly into the ground. And I was promised that at some point there would be an easement and a culvert and that water would be going into some kind of reclamation thing. I live within one mile of the river. It's going directly into the groundwater. And the people who are responsible for it, the developers, are not paying for the nitrogen and the phosphorus removal. The people of Brevard County are paying for it, yet we keep building more homes. We're not holding people accountable for it. I can't even get the street fixed. If we're really concerned about that river, we have to look at the cause of it. We can't put a Band-Aid on the problem. We have to start looking at what is causing all of the nitrogen and phosphorus to go into the river. Housing associations asking everybody, what do your lawn put fertilizer on it? We want it to look green. Well, they lost a battle there last year. Now you can have a zero-scape lawn. But that doesn't hold builders and people responsible. And if 
we as commissioners up here are responsible for your great-great-grandchildren swimming in the river. Right now we're failing. I think we have to hold the road department and the people that are taking care of the river responsible. If they're not going to do it, then we'll get them in court. Because if that's the only way to do it, that's what we need to do. Time's up. Thank you. Charles Tovey, 2555 Roberts Road, Melbourne, Florida. Born on the 4th of July, celebrated a little bit this year for the first time in over a decade. But anyways, and it's hard to not be an American and things when you're born on the 4th of July. I wonder how many vets are in jail. And is there no belief in reformance that people can't change and make them well that's a whole different issue i want to thank all the firefighters and police and everybody that made us safe during the holidays and safe today i uh put on my card about the homeless situation and they have um they have a program in hillsborough county which helps the homeless and they also have the first step program in Volusia, which just now started up, and it's really promising from my understanding and perspective. And instead of suppressing these people, and this is what I do, give them an opportunity to make a choice to better themselves and make secure decisions and long-term stability, and I utilize that today. And if the gentleman behind me follows me in the river that I clean, I go underwater, I have open cuts and things, and I would go barefoot most of the time. There is a glass situation that I'm concerned about, as well as the stingrays, and there's no warning signs about things. Um, I wanted to commend uh, RUAG for moving in, in, into Titusville and 600 jobs they'll be bringing. I wonder if they're EDC motivated. Um, first step, socialism, how you're taking my taxpayer money to give it to other people so they can have a job. I, I, I don't see how I can give people, you know, it's up to the individual to get a job and to have a business and everything else. And there are employment unfair, I think it's the Unfair Employment Act about considerations for criminal punishment and lifetime prejudice against it. Yeah, lifelong punishment for a crime that they already paid, and I get that, and I thank you. Almost finished here. Uh, the tortoise, there is a, another tortoise, they got a picture of it that was running down the street, fleeing for its life in Palm Shores, and I'm asking to, for Palm Shores to be recognized for an environmental area, and still want to do my DIRAs, designated environmental recharge areas, to where we can have the homeless, the jails, and people, give them another chance. If they don't produce, cut them loose. Thank you, and have a nice day. And, We'll move into public hearings. Item 4A, <clears throat> this is a resolution petition to vacate a six foot wide public utility easement in Barefoot Bay. The purpose is to remove an existing residential encroachment from the easement. Approximately 474 square feet would be vacated and we have received no objections. I make a motion to accept. We have a motion to accept. Second. We have a second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 4-0. Item 4B is a petition to vacate a portion of a 50-foot wide public right-of-way of Elmo Street. This is in Clear Lake Village, Coco. The petitioner owns both sides of the easement. There's approximately 6,375 square feet to be vacated and we have received no objections. 
Make a motion to grant the petition to vacate. We have a motion to vacate. We have a second. We have a second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes four zip. Four zero. Item 4C. This is a resolution and petition to vacate a portion of a six foot wide public utility easement. This is also in Barefoot Bay. There's approximately 10 square feet of easement to be vacated. This removes an existing shed encroachment, and we have received no objections. We have a speaker's card for Fred Wojciak. Yes, sir. Do you, would you like to comment? No comment. Okay. Board. Make a motion we grant the petition to vacate. We have a motion to vacate. Second. We have a second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 4 0. Do you want to do 4 F next? What about 4 D? I'll do 4 D. Okay. Uh, 4D is a, a public hearing on tax equity and financial responsibility act uh, revenue bonds and it's required by federal law in order to qualify the bonds for tax free financing. Um, it relates to the VR charter school and there are representatives here if you need to hear from them if there's any uh, public comment. I have no cards. Make a motion to approve the resolution for bonds we have a motion to approve the resolution for the bonds second we have a second anyone wish to vote no passes 4 0 4 e commissioners as part of our federal funding through the housing and urban development for CBG and home we're required to do a five-year consolidated plan which the board approved last year and then every year we do what's called our annual action plan this is the first of two public hearings before you where we seek input from the community and the development of that plan the final uh, version of which will come before you in a final public hearing on August 8th we will also be taking more public comment through email and through fax all the way up until August 1st all comments will be included in the annual action plan Position of the board. Do we have a motion to accept this consolidated one-year action plan? There, there actually at this point oh. is no vote. This is okay. just again the opportunity for public comment. Okay, I got it. We have no, we have no public comment. Item 4F is a resolution and ordinance regarding amendment of the fee schedule for right-of-way and easement applications and permits and implementing the local governing authority provided in, in the Advanced Wireless Infrastructure Deployment Act. This is a legislative act by the Florida legislature which opens our right-of-ways to small wireless on county-owned poles and other poles that exist within the right-of-ways. We expect it to generate a significant influx of permitting activity and that that permitting activity will not be, the cost of which won't be covered by the permit fees we're allowed to charge. We have no cards. Thoughts, ideas? I'd just like to make a comment. This is another unfunded mandate from Tallahassee. Just like to put that on the record. And as such, can we, um, Mr. Knox, what would happen if we, if we don't approve this? Well, you're going to have to follow the law no matter what. And all this ordinance does is implement the provisions of the law and changes the ordinance to uh, reflect the restrictions that the legislature has placed on your ability to regulate small wireless devices in the public right of way. Uh, that's kind of what I suspected. Thank you, Tallahassee. And for the record, that's sarcastic. Okay. Um, so we have to have a motion and a... Anyone, anybody want to make a motion or do we want to just pass on this? I'll make, I'll make since I was up there at one point, I'll, I'll make a motion. I wasn't there obviously when this passed, but I've been up there prior, so I'll make a motion. <laughs> Bless you. <laughs> okay, we have a motion to approve the resolution and the ordinance. We have a second? A begrudgingly second. Okay, we have a begrudging second. And anyone wish to vote no? I would say we also have a begrudging 4-0 vote. 
4G. Item 4G. <clears throat> this is a petition to vacate two 15-foot wide <laughs> utility easement and drainage easements. This is in the Indian River Colony Club in District 4. And this underlying purpose for this is to correct some discrepancies in the record documents in an expedient manner. I have a card from Patrick Healy. Did he? Okay. Pleasure of the board. Make a motion to grant the petition to vacate. We have a motion to vacate. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 4-0. 4-H. Four 4-H four is an ordinance that uh, changes the current requirement that the county put a reverter provision in every deed that it transfers property with to allow the county discretion to either place the reverter in it or not put, place the reverter in it. It's needed because uh, sometimes when we convey property to other entities or local governments, they may put uh, that property to a use which results in some kind of a pollution situation down the road, and we don't want to get the property back if that's the case. Good thinking. Kind of like the jail. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure of the board. I move to adopt the proposed ordinance. We have a motion to approve the proposed ordinance amendment to Chapter 2. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 4 0. Moving on to unfinished business 5A. Uh, commissioners, with your uh, indulgence, I'd like to give you a little bit of the background on this particular item. <coughs> the board authorized an RFP process in 2012-2013 for uh, solid waste collection services. Uh, the contract was executed with waste management during August of 2013. That contract provided for waste management to receive a CPI-related increase, which is capped at a maximum increase of 3% annually for the life of the 10-year contract. At the time that contract was entered into, hurricane reserves that were in that particular fund were $5.5 million approximately. That was in the solid waste collection fund. The board at that time decided to establish a solid waste collection assessment rate that ratepayers would pay, which was below the amount that was needed to fund the new collection contract that was just executed with waste management. The board's intent was to draw down on the hurricane reserves over time and then re revisit the assessment rates that were charged for solid waste collection to stabilize those reserves. Monies that were involved in those when we uh, use those funds for hurricane purposes are really not the responsibility of, of waste management. That is a function that uh, we have in that rate structure uh, to the degree that we have funds available for, uh, in the reserve for um, the purpose of um, debris removal during hurricanes. At the time of Hurricane Matthew, solid waste reserves had uh, diminished to $4.1 million. Uh, all of those reserves were drawn down and, um, and because of the hurricane when we had uh, Hurricane Matthew. However, uh, we are anticipating approximately $2.6 million uh, in reimbursement from FEMA reimbursement that will be in, in the account, uh, hopefully sometime this year. In summary, uh, the prior, a prior board uh, back in 2013 chose to draw down on the existing solid waste collection reserve to keep the assessment rates constant, although the contractual CPI index provided for annual increases. And that resulted in a shortfall between solid waste collection assessment rate that was charged to ratepayers and the funding that's required to meet contractual obligations that solid waste has with our collection vendor, which up to now has been met by utilizing parts of those reserves. This agenda item tonight provides the board four options to address the situation I've described, and I'd like just to focus on two of those options. The first option, uh, which is in the uh, staff agenda, provides for a 5.5% increase from the annual rate of 128.21 and that would go to 135.26. 
That's a yearly increase of $7.05 or a monthly increase of 58.75 cents a month. Thereafter, under that proposal, the rate assessment would increase by the CPI rate that's provided for in the current collection contract with a not to exceed of 3% annually. If this option were adopted under, um, uh, under what's been proposed, the reserve at the end of the contract in 2023 would be approximately $1.4 million. The second option that I, I'd like to highlight was one that staff prepared, and it was prepared, as, as you know, at the request of Commissioner Tobio. Under that option, there would be, uh, first we would re reduce the, um, the rate increase to 4.8 percent. That is achieved by adding a solid waste collection revenue stream, $50,000 annually, that is currently provided by waste management to the solid waste recycling, and an additional $50,000 $50, a year that is annually provided to the general fund from uh, waste management in support of economic development. Under this option, the assessment would increase from an annual rate of 128.21 to 134.36. That's an annual increase of $6.15 or a monthly increase of 51.25 cents. Thereafter, the assessment rate would increase by the CPI index rate provided for in the current collection contract with the, once again, um, and it's, it was uh, developed to have a not to exceed cap of 3% annually, which is the maximum rate that is provided for in the current contract. Under this option, um, at the end of the contract in 2023, once again, we would anticipate um, 1.4 million being in the reserve. Uh, the remaining options that we provided, two, three, and four, would build additional reserves either earlier or over time, depending on what uh, selection was option, and, and, and that is attached uh, in the agenda request. Staff is seeking direction on the option or options that the board would like to proceed with or elaborate further on uh, if we need to. Uh, we did bring it on this agenda so we would have the time frame uh, that we could come back on the 25th if that was necessary. And so we're looking for the board's uh, direction on how to proceed at this point. Chair recognizes Commissioner Pritchett. I am. Um I appreciate all the work you guys have done. You've, you've really spent some time squishing the numbers. And um, I, I liked option one, and then when Commissioner Tobias had sent out the other one, I, I think it looks pretty good. And I actually called Mr. Yuri, and he said that that was fine with him too. It would just um, get rid of that other 100,000 that we have going back and forth. So I'm, I'm actually liking the plan that Commissioner Tobias sent out. It's, it's only a matter of a few pennies, but it's less for the taxpayers to be putting in. It covers all the bases, and if we have a problem with a lot of storms, we're going to have to revisit this anyways for some more funding. So that's, that's going to probably be my selection there is the one that we don't have in one, two, three, four. Chair recognizes Commissioner Tobias. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I, I want to thank uh, Interim Commissioner uh, Abate on this one. You, you heard uh, at our Commissioner, workshop. Commissioner Abate. Did I say Commissioner? Yeah, I'm sorry. Did. He doesn't want that job. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You, trust me, you don't. Uh, uh, manager, um, you heard 25%, 26%, and he's worked extremely hard to get it down to 5.5%, and, five and, and I, I greatly appreciate that. Uh, when this contract was signed, as he mentioned, um, it would not have been a contract that I would have put my name to, but uh, there were a bunch of sweetheart portions that, that went into this contract. And, uh, this, and is, this is where we thank the former board. It, it is what it is, and I want to thank uh, um, Interim County Manager for mentioning the, the reason why there is this increase, that you know, there is raising taxes, not a very good thing, but when fees go up, um, that's not the same thing, and I, unfortunately, I, I don't think the former board um, made prudent steps and puts us in this position. Let me tell you something else very interesting. I'm sure you guys know about this, but I learned, about, well, I learned this way. When I looked at the CPI, I thought, you know, this is 1.26. We're married to this number. 
the contract doesn't use the CPI, it uses the Southern Region CPI, which is 2.24. So potentially too bad that the Constitutional Amendment didn't foresee the Southern Region CPI. That would be quite a bit different. But uh, either way, um, when I made that suggestion, um, I didn't have these numbers, so I, wanted, I, I want to let the other commissioners know I wanted, I wanted to find out if we took that $100,000 and we put it into lower rates, would that disproportionately impact County Commission District 3? So looking at that, um, it looks like 30% of the, the fee, uh, the people that incur this fee are actually in Commissioner Pritchett's district. 25% are in Commissioner Barfield's district. 25% are in Commissioner Smith's district. Only 9.5 are in mine, and Commissioner Isnardi is right under 9%. So uh, disproportionately, the fee will be lessened for those districts, but I think it is extremely fair that we lower fees for the individuals that actually are uh, contributing into this. So I know it's only a little bit, but uh, I think it would be prudent of us to uh, transfer those, those funds, which uh, speaking with Yuri, he has said that, that they can budget out uh, in order to drop it from 5.5 uh, .5 to 4.8. Just be aware as we move forward, um, don't rush into it the same way I did, looking at the general CPI. We have to unfortunately look at the southern region CPI, which accounts for quite a bit of difference. But again, I want to say thank you so much for uh, crunching these numbers. Uh, I think uh, Jill was instrumental in this. I know Yuri was instrumental in this, as well as uh, uh, the county manager. And I apologize for the tardiness getting my, my chart out, but it just took a while to, to, to pile through this. So um, I, it's a plug for my idea, but uh, again, I want to thank the staff that worked so darn hard on it. Mr. Abate, did you have something else you wanted to add? Uh, I think we're, uh, we're good with the dialogue we've heard. Pleasure of the board. Don't everybody speak at once. <laughs> I, I just make a move. Um, to go with Commissioner Tobias' plan that he sent out. Um, it's option which one? Uh, it's option five. It's really not on there, but it's the one where we go to the 134.36, and it's um, getting rid of the $100,000 that we transfer. And hopefully we won't have any more hurricanes here. we got to clean up after. Do we have a second? I just want to be clear on which one it is. <clears throat> Could you go through it again and say exactly? It's that one, sir. It was sent to us by email, and I actually called Yuri yesterday. And uh, to okay with it. Mr. Tobias, would you like to second this since it was yours? I, was, I thought it'd be, I wasn't going to second my motion, uh, you know, mine, but I, I, I second Commissioner Pritchett on this. Thank you. Okay, we have a motion on the board to, um, so that's option five. We have a second. All those in favor, vote aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4-0. Okay, we need board direction for medical marijuana ordinance. Pleasure of the board. All right, I would like to ask Mr. Knox for some direction on this. Well, of course, it always depends upon what you want to do. You have the right to pass an ordinance banning medical marijuana. Uh, and there's a, there's a dispute among the lawyers as to whether it can be countywide or unincorporated area. I think that uh, it's probably going to be end up being unincorporated area because the legislature will fix it if you try to do it countywide. I'll guarantee it. Uh, that's option number one. Option number two is you can pass regulations that would uh, affect both uh, medical marijuana treatment centers and pharmacies, which you have to treat the same as you have to treat both the same. We don't have uh, either listed specifically in any of the zoning categories. The closest thing we have is BU1, where it's a medical, um, I think it's called medical clinics, medical, medical buildings, which it would probably fit within. I think the staff has told me that's where they would put it. 
However, the uh, that would, again, if you're going to regulate the medical marijuana treatment centers, you, you've got to regulate pharmacies the same way. Uh, so that would be a different ordinance altogether. The third option is to just take pharmacies and medical marijuana and put them in the BU1 zoning classification, which is where they're treated, both treated. Um, and the reason I would recommend that that's, if you're going to do, the last option is to do nothing, but if you're going to do nothing, I think you're going to, they're going to raise a probability that you're going to get a lawsuit from somebody over in Orlando who says he can put it anywhere he wants to because you didn't pass an ordinance telling you where he can put it. So if you're going to do nothing, I suggest you, you really pass an ordinance putting the BU1 classification as the place where you're going to put pharmacies and medical marijuana treatment centers. Which would be option three that you suggested? Yeah. Commissioner Tobai, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And this goes against everything I believe in. I don't know where I am on this one, but I certainly want to throw something out there because I did spend a little bit of time with that, with this. If we look at our surrounding counties as well as cities, it looks like uh, temporary bans or moratoriums have been placed in Orange, Seminole, Palm Beach, you know, St. Lucie. It looks like Indian River is leaning this way. Here, here, here's the outcome that I see to this, and I don't want this to jaundice anyone's opinion, but if the surrounding counties and municipalities start limiting <coughs> MMTCs, then my guess would be the market would then drive that into Brevard County. And our last ordinance that we were looking at, it, we were looking at potentially, and I think we were arguing over the uh, ratio 1 to 40,000 or 1 to 60,000. There is no ratio here. So in other words, if we are the only place where M medical marijuana treatment centers can be in the area, my guess would be we would have a proliferation of, of them because we would have no mechanism in order to limit that one way or another. So I think that probably, uh, you know, would lean me to place a moratorium on that. Um, while I certainly could live with a responsible number of these, uh, I just believe that uh, if we were to allow uh, or re regulate them in the same way that we regulate pharmacies, I, I, and then there were no, no availability in, in surrounding counties, I just think that Brevard County would have a ton. Now, even if we do, as 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 uh, Mr. Knox said, you know that doesn't stop Cocoa Beach, right, from saying okay. Uh, and and I don't know anything about Cocoa Beach. It's it's just one that allowed prior to, so they may change it. You know, saying okay, this is a economic driver. And uh, I mean, think about if if there was nowhere that you could get MMTCs in in the Tri County area, with the exception of Cocoa Beach. So I just want to be very careful. If we do move forward, understand that. Um, there could be an absolute ton in Brevard County in very short order if this ban uh, is in, I mean, these are populous counties, Orange, Palm Beach, Osceola. Uh, it's just something to be aware of as we move forward. Well, it doesn't, if they ban it, it doesn't preclude cities in their counties from selling it. And for example, Palm Bay, we don't know what they're going to do. We could even have Indian Harbor Beach or Satellite Beach or any of the other cities in this county. So. I don't know that we can just carte blanche say that we would be the only ones because, again, they could have cities in uh, these different counties. Any other, any other thoughts? I thought I'd let all you guys go first. <laughs> <laughs> you know, Mr. Barfield. It's one of these things where, I mean, I didn't, I voted against this, uh, but the voters did put it in. So I'm kind of moving towards I, the way that the state uh, put put their statutes to us. I'm almost I'm at the point where, you know, we might as well draft an ordinance uh, that includes it, you know, in the BU BU one zoning areas. It's going to come eventually. Uh, we might as well do it. Uh, the cities are going to do what they're going to do. So, so you know, I, I'm kind of leaning. Let's just go ahead and do it. I, we're going to have to see, we'll end up seeing it again and again and again. And at this point, you know, I think we just need to go with it and get it over with. No, I get to go last. 
I, uh, I hear Mr. Commissioner Tobias' concern, and that would be my concern also. And it's not that I, I'm, it's not so much the concern of the medical part of it, but I know where this is leading. It's, it's leading towards getting recreational marijuana eventually legal. And I, I just, um, this is hard to do that, you know, to put any limitations on numbers. But if it's purely for medical, I still, I, I don't understand why they're not just in pharmacies anyways. If it's a drug for medical, I don't know why it just didn't work out like the opiates did, going through a, 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 a prescription and, and this wouldn't even be a discussion. So with that, the, that c still confuses me. So there's still more to this than I know. Um, I'm probably going to side with Commissioner Barfield on this because it's, it's coming down the road anyways and it, it's something we need to do. My biggest concern still and always is that it doesn't affect our children and we keep it out of, out of the reach of our children. So and I'm sure there's things coming along to help God with that too. So that's my thoughts right now. Well, the reason it's not in pharmacies is because it's not legal. And, but going forward, I would guess that if, um, if medical marijuana is made legal by the feds, then I would just suspect that your pharmacies will purchase all of these mom and pop shops. And so the, it will be in pharmacies at that point in time. I'm looking at the fact that we need to control what we can control. And I think the option that Mr. Knox, because the, the legislature threw us a curveball, yeah. And they pulled the rug out from under us because we, I think we had direction. So we don't have direction now. So we're going to have to make a decision kind of on the fly. And I think this gives us the most latitude uh, requiring the BU1. Do you want to, uh, I mean, it's fine. I, I, I guess it's three. I just wanted to make sure if it was a tie that we table it tomorrow. Sorry, I just wanted to make sure with only four commissioners that, you know, we have the required vote here to mm -hmm. to move forward because, you know, it's not doing nothing if we table it for two weeks until Commissioner is nardy, but it sounds like there are at least three votes to go that way. So, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, I didn't want it to go down on a tie is what right. I'm saying. Right, well, yeah, we, and we don't, I wouldn't let it go for a tie because then it's, then we're, our goose is cooked. So, um, okay, so anybody want to make a, a motion here? And a second. All right. I'll Who wants to do the honors? <laughs> Make a motion that we draft an ordinance for medical marijuana facilities and the BU1 zoning, and it be the same as pharmacies. A second. Okay. We have a motion on the floor and a second to approve a BU1 classification. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Nay. Passes 3-1. Uh, we, uh, we had a card on 5B, I'm sorry. Cynthia Brewer, are you still here? Would you like to comment? Sorry, I apologize. Cynthia Brewer, 2337 Pizarro Lane, Melbourne, Florida, 32940. Um, so we're all aware that there were um, pretty big changes to the implementation of Amendment 2. Um, since our last meeting, we were making progress. We were doing things together. I think all of us were unanimously on the same page, which was great. But then Tallahassee decided to, like you said, pull the rug out from underneath you and take away home rule. You have two choices. You can either allow dispensary locations or you can ban them. You cannot do anything else. You have no power. So you're going to say, okay, we'll allow them in our communities wherever they want as long as they're 500 feet away from a school. Well, that's everywhere. And the surrounding counties, like Commissioner Tobias said, uh, they're already actively banning them. And the cities within those counties, like Orlando and Winter Springs, and Winter Garden, and Vero Beach. Vero, who had an ordinance in place and then allowed a dispensary to open, actually took it back to ban it because they don't want their city to be overrun with dispensaries. Now, obviously, you know in the months that we've known each other how I feel about medical cannabis, and I am um, very sorry what Tallahassee did to you because Senate Bill 8A was not what I voted for. Senate Bill 8A is not 
the will of the voters. Um, it's far from perfect, but it's, it's a start. And um, I really would have preferred a moratorium. I would have liked more time because they threw this on you June. We met the end of May. Uh, implementation is supposed to start uh, August, July 3rd deadline, so August and September and October. We need more time in Brevard to just say that we're going to okay it and then we could be overrun. This could be more than we prepared for. But this isn't my decision, so good luck to you. That's what I was going to say before you voted. Um, the other question that kind of plagues my mind is the availability of information about this topic. And I'm a little heated because when I go to pull the agenda, like I do every single time before a meeting, I get some blacked out version of the agenda like this. So then, obviously, a little perplexed, I decided to wait a few days and pull another one. Here's the agenda with a little bit more, but still blacked out. That's weird. Different parts of this thing blacked out. Well, I know my rights as uh, one of the uh, public, <laughs> and so I you know, request to get a copy. And all the information is here. So I wondered, why would you black it out? Well, in this correspondence, inner office correspondence, medical marijuana treatment centers were compared to with meth labs, which is absolutely preposterous. First of all, dispensary locations, which you guys are trying to decide to allow or ban, do not have volatile processes done. That is done in a processing side after the growers have the product. On a dispensary level, you don't have butane oil, butane available. You're providing the community with their medicine. So comparing MMTCs to meth labs is not only um, undermining my hard work, my colleagues' hard work, and the patients of our great county, but it's also an uninformed and disrespectful sentence to put in a, an agenda. So um, I think that I've said enough about that. I'm going to support your decision to um, zone BU1. I actually work in a pharmacy, a pharmacist that would love to be able to participate in this but can't risk losing his DEA license because it is federally illegal. So it does affect me now on a professional level. So still all in, but I appreciate you guys taking the time. Thank you. Can I ask a question? Sure. Please. On, on the pages you're saying that are blacked out, is that from what you're downloading online? Yes, from the website. If I, I download all mine also, mm -hmm. and I, I put on a flash drive and I bring it. You might have a program problem, because I've never had blacked out papers. And I would definitely have thought that first, because I always pull it about a week out, um, and then I look at how long I'm going to be here, and uh, I thought it was a computer issue. But when the first copy is, and I printed multiple, is like this without anything here, and then blacked out, the next day later I get actually more information and then blacked out. I know it's not a computer issue. The agenda itself, because I do it too and I never yeah. get blacked out, and I just go on a regular computer page. Yeah, I mean, I eventually finally got it, but okay. if you think about... Um, I've been having a problem, too, blacking, blacking out. I think, it's a, I think it's a language IT issue. And you know what? I hope it is. I hope it's a language IT issue, because I'm glad I didn't have to see it. It does not deter from the fact that the language was used to compare my hard work and the industry professionals that are highly regulated with OSHA standards and um, just, <laughs> they're going to be regulated by a whole other group right. of people. I just, I just wanted to, to mention that fact, though. So. Okay. The clerk's office has their agenda placed on brevardclerk.us anytime there's a change made. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure the site that you're going to to retrieve your agenda. Is it the county site or is it the clerk's it's office? It's the county site. Yeah, it's so the one I use all the time. We don't post anything to the 
county site. The clerk's office does not. So that would be a county IT issue. Okay. But if you go to BrevardClerk.us, mm -hmm. every agenda, when there's changes, it's posted there, and you can retrieve it. Yeah, they show when they were edited. Right, but the um, full obviously not. showing a timeline of when <laughs> I pulled them from different places, but mostly, obviously, seeing a blacked out page is a little suspicious. But then finding out what's underneath that page the agenda. Yeah. has really nothing to do with suspicion anymore. There, it's just the content was. Um, a little Thank you. difficult. Thank you, Ms. Burr. I appreciate it. Thank you. 6A1. Good evening, Commissioners. This is a request from Flora Della Costa Townhomes to obtain three waivers that will allow the approval of their site plan. The first waiver relates to the sidewalk requirement, and they want to postpone the sidewalk construction and installation along Turtle Beach Lane by entering into a uh, sidewalk assessment agreement. The second waiver is to reduce the right-of-way width, I mean the pavement width from 22 feet to 12 feet on Turtle Beach Lane. And the third waiver would be to allow the townhome parking to back out directly into the Turtle Beach Lane right-of-way. All of these waivers have been granted pre by previous boards for a similar development just down the road from, from where this is. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer them. I have a card from Mr. Michael Allen. I presume you're from the engineering, Allen Engineering. Okay. Pleasure of the board. I make a motion that we grant all three waivers. We have a motion on the floor to grant the waivers. Second. We have a second. Anyone wish to vote no? Passes 4-0. Six F one. Who who is uh okay. okay. Commissioner Tobias, you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh as you know, we went through the uh, hiring process uh, in order to uh, uh, retain a new county manager. Um, the results uh, I was not very pleased with um, and asked that uh, we potentially hold uh, bringing in these candidates until the board met again. Um, some of the candidates had some large issues that probably were not uh, necessary in order to bring to the board's attention. Uh, this was brought to uh, uh, Mr. Visco. He agreed with that. So uh, even though interim county manager Frank Abate did not apply for this position, I would like to uh, put his name in the um, in the mix and consider him for the permanent county manager position. And uh, as we move forward with uh, with the selection of uh, uh, of this position, I requested. I, I saw this, um, and I requested uh, W. D. Higginbotham, our hired uh, gun, as it were. Um, to come and advise us and give us his perspective on the candidates. Mr. Chair, Commissioners, uh, for the record, I'm W.D. Higginbotham with the Mercer Group. Uh, your hard gun to uh, yes. use your words, sir. <laughs> uh, the where we are right now, I presented the, well, let me just make a quick summary. We did a pretty extensive uh, recruitment uh, in addition to some specific solicitations. I kind of summarized that in a letter to you uh, about a month ago. Um, we, had, uh, we had nearly 200 inquiries, or at least looking at our, our site, uh, but we only had 25, 28 written responses. 
Uh, there were only seven of the 28 that I felt met the qualifications that you had set forth and we advertised. Uh, once I took a second look at those seven, uh, I thought that I would talk to six of them. I eliminated one of the seven. Uh, of the six I spoke with, I uh, decided to uh, consider five, but what I recommended to you were three that I felt were the strongest candidates, and they are strong candidates. Uh, one is uh, 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 the uh, city manager in Miami, one is a county manager in Colorado, and one is a county manager in New Jersey. Uh, two of them obviously have coastal experience, which is one of the things you talked about, Miami and the uh, New Jersey. Uh, the candidate there met with uh, or dealt with uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, the candidate in Colorado uh, had uh, disaster experience dealing with wildfires, and uh, he didn't seem to think snow was a problem, but uh, to me that would be a problem. But that being said, what where we are right now is uh, you've not spoken to the candidates, you've not talked to them that I, that I know that you have. You certainly are free to call them if you, if you like. But I do believe we have three candidates that I'm comfortable in recommending to you that uh, exceed the qualifications uh, that you uh, directed me to look for. And any one of these three could manage your, manage your county as you uh, anticipate or what I set out looking for. Unfortunately, we did not get the responses that we had hoped for. Uh, but there's nothing I can do to make candidates respond. Uh, I'm not going to sit here and give you a bunch of reasons why I think we didn't. Uh, I, generally speaking, I don't think in some of the areas we were competitive. Uh, we were com competing with uh, even some city manager positions that were offering uh, compensation that uh, uh, well exceeded uh, what we were talking about in our announcement. Uh, but be that as it may, we did get uh, three quality candidates. Uh, each of those three uh, current compensation exceeds 200000 and uh, I'm sure you can anticipate that they would be looking for something like that if you were to select one of them, interview them and select one of them. Uh, but I don't discuss salary with them, only discuss what was their base compensation so I can bring that to you. Uh, ultimately, the negotiation, if you were to select one of those, uh, it would rest with you or me if you, if you ask me to do that, uh, which I'm prepared to do. Uh, my recommendation to you at this point would be, first of all, that you interview uh, either one or all three of the candidates. Uh, I think you would have a, a good opinion uh, a different opinion because right now you've only seen the paperwork on these candidates. Looking at the paperwork, you cannot get a feel for the quality of the candidates. Uh, they are in CEO positions right now. One of them has, uh, uh, in fact, one of the candidates, one from New Jersey, has about nine years private sector experience before he entered into the public sector where he is now, where he's been for nine years. Uh, that being said, um, that would be my initial recommendation to you. Uh, if you do not want to do that, I can offer some alternatives to you, but uh, you just tell me where you want me to go with that. Thank you, Mr. Higginbotham. WD. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Questions from the board? Commissioner Barfield. I'll have to say I went through all the resumes. I went through the ones you recommended. I went through all the others, too, in detail. And I just did not get the impression that there was ones that would really fit in what we have here. I, uh, I think we were stretching it. I don't think that they, uh, I, mean, I see some similarities of what we have here, but I just did not get the feeling that they really would understand what it is to be in Brevard County. The, uh, the salary's an issue. Uh, it's, it's going to be a lot of work for someone to come in here, and they have to understand all the intricacies of a 72-mile-long county. So my, my initial going through it, I went through it a lot. I did not see that I thought any of those would be a county manager. I did see quite a few that I thought would be very good assistant county managers, the ones that were not in your top seven, but that's another story. So I, I would really like to see that us really consider Frank Abate as the new county manager, but I'd also like to wait until we have a full board to go any further with it. So that's my, that's mine. 
The chair recognizes Commissioner Pritchett. I don't think I could have said that better. So um, I agree. I, I went through them and I did a little bit of um, extra research on a few, even on the flash drives, and um, I just didn't kind of catch one that I th that I thought would be the fit here. So I also would like, sir, to wait till um, Commissioner Isnardi's back, if if that's possible. Um, and you know, in between that time too, we've had um, Mr. Abate change his mind and, and say that he would consider this position where the beginning before when we started this he, he was not in in the running for it at all so i, I think that um with with y'all's consensus here what we do I, i'd like to wait for commissioner isnardi and uh, we have a discussion commissioner tobiah would you like to weigh in on this um I'm guessing that we probably have the votes without Commissioner Isnardi, but seeing as uh, I don't, we have a wonderful interim uh, county manager right now, I would make a motion to table this uh, till the next meeting in which we will uh, bring it up. Okay, I, I, before we get to that point, I would like to weigh in too. I appreciate what you've done, and I spent a lot of time with them uh, with your with your introductions to these these folks, um, I would I would reject out of hand my opinion just based on what I see on paper, because you can f get an awful lot more from a face-to-face -face interview. And if we didn't have somebody of the quality of Frank Abate that was willing to take the job, I would say, let's talk to a couple of these gentlemen, and if they didn't work, then we could move on, because we've paid you the money and you're going to find somebody for us. But since Mr. Abate has changed his mind, and I've worked with him for two and a half years, and I can tell you he's a stellar individual, and I've thrown him a few curveballs in my time, and he was able to hit them out of the park. So, um, But the real key that none of these gentlemen would be able to bring to the table, or any others that you may bring to us, is the institutional knowledge that we lost from Mr. Witten. We will gain that through Mr. Abate because he has the institutional knowledge. He's worked here for 150 years, is it? <laughs> he looks I really like good, that, doesn't I like he? To that number, so. Uh, so I would like to go along with my uh, cohorts and table this uh, for the next meeting so we can make it a 5-0 unanimous uh, vote. And I would thank you very much for your efforts. And uh, through no fault of your own, we're going to go in a different direction. Yeah, well, Mr. Chair, Commissioners, let me say this. I always encourage an internal candidate be a candidate or an internal uh, person be a candidate. Uh, I'm a strong believer that if you have a quality person in-house, uh, they should be considered. And uh, you obviously have done that. Uh, you would, I don't vote here, but you would certainly get my, uh, my support on a decision such as that. Uh, it's someone you can see. Uh, and you've experienced, and so uh, you don't hurt my feelings by making a decision like that. But if that's the direction you want to go, uh, if you would like me to say I support that, I will. Uh, but even though I don't vote. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you for your efforts. Yes, we sir. appreciate it. Thank you very much. Okay, so this, mo this uh, motion is tabled uh, to the next meeting, and moving right along. Uh, 6F2, citizen request by Bruce Stevenson, illegal and unauthorized PVC pipes in county right away. <coughs> Mr. Stevenson, did you realize when you contacted my office you were going to stir up such a hornet's nest? Uh, not really, <laughs> but I think it's really important to keep in mind, keep Brevard beautiful is our policy and it should be maintained so i you know i live in uh, the sun tree community but more importantly i live in brevard county and i believe in our commitment to brevard county's policy of keep brevard beautiful this is extremely important therefore and i think you have some photographs i would like to bring to your attention if you are not already aware of it, of the erection by AT&T of numerous ugly six-foot tall poles in the rights-of-way in our county. 
Uh, maybe you haven't noticed them now, but I think if you drive around Brevard County, you'll see them being, uh, being erected in the rights of way in our county, by, primarily by AT&T. Now, you've been furnished some photographs, and the, uh, the erection of these poles is extensive. Now, I made, when I saw this, I made an initial inquiry as to how this could happen, because I've never seen it happen in Brevard County before in the, in the 25 years that we've lived here. Because not only in the Sun Tree community, but also in Brevard County, we keep our, our right-of-ways, our county property, in beautiful condition. And as you know, we've taken over uh, some of the landscaping duties of the county in the Sun Tree community. And we try to uphold the standards that the community has maintained. So when I discovered this, then I, I first contacted uh, John Denninghoff, who was the interim assistant county manager who was just appointed to, to this position. And he was the former public works director. And he didn't know anything about it. I then went down to Andy Holmes. He again was appointed to the director of public works. And in John Demenhoff's previous position, and he didn't know anything about this. And as you know, when we go back in, uh, at least in my view of our county and our rights away, this is county property, but also it's citizens' property. And these rights away belong to all of us, all of our residents in, in Brevard County, and basically is safeguarded by our elected representatives, which is our county commissioners. So we, sh we should look at matters like this very important, as they're very important to know how this can be out of hand if there's no proper supervision or oversight. So uh, consequently, after I mentioned this or did this little investigation, the, there was a further inquiry into this matter, and it was determined basically that these poles, most of them, most of these poles, if not all, were placed illegally in the Brevard County rights of way as they were not contained in any right of way permit whatsoever. And we all know if it's not in permit, it's not in the permit, it, it cannot be done. But it appears that AT&T or some contractor just decided to put these poles up because that would indicate that's where their right of way happens to be. But that is not the way we work in government. We need the authority to do so. And they didn't have the, the authority. And so I believe, in my opinion, that these erections of these poles are a violation of uh, public policy and should be removed and, and done immediately because we still have them, because they're not there without any authority. And consequently, any delay really condones the illegal conduct. Now, in this connection, and I see that I don't have too much time left, I would like to note that Spectrum and Florida Power and Light, uh, they, they have these utilities and fiberglass uh, conduits in the right of way. Now, are we going to give them authority to put their, their pipes in the right of way, poles in the right of, in the right of way? I don't think that would be proper conduct. So it's really important that we follow the rules of law and regarding and then one last point, regarding the staff report that you have before you were, they mentioned Department of Transportation has a requirement for uh, six foot poles every 500 feet in, uh, feet in their right of way. This relates just to the, the traffic centers and the traffic controls and not to the whole right of way alongside the public highways. Otherwise, you'd see one six foot pole every 300 feet thank you, our, Mr. Stevenson. in our side, in our streets. And thank you very much for your time. We have a card from Todd Foley. Oh, yes. Oh, there it is. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm just sorry. Good to see you, Mr. Stevenson. Good evening. 
Todd Foley, I'm the general manager for Suntry. Uh, Mr. Stevenson came to us uh, a couple months ago about this issue and our board of directors had an opportunity to review it and at least at this time they are opposed to any of these poles being there unless they are necessary by permit or necessary for a safety issue. Um, many of you know Suntry is approximately 13,000 residents, 4,500 homes um, in the middle of the county and uh, I can answer some questions on how they got there based on a, uh, some communication with the contractor at the time and what she felt was the, nece was the necessity. So if you have those questions, I'm happy to answer her thoughts on the matter. Anyone have any questions for Mr. Foley? Thank you, sir. Pleasure of the ward. I got to say, I, uh, Mr. Stevenson, when I read this, I said, what is this? So as soon as I left work that day, I rode coming home and I counted 22 of these things. Never even thought about it. So I appreciate you bringing this to us. I, uh, I actually, I, I, think, I think something we need to consider is I'd like to direct staff to go work with the utilities companies at first to see if we can work up some sort of permitting pr procedure. And I want to get feedback from Andy first, though. And if that doesn't work, then we're going to come up with our own. And then we can tell the utility companies that's what we're going to do. So I'd like to hear your input, Andy. Thank you. Uh, good evening, commissioners. Mr. Stevenson did an excellent job of outlining the issues, and we don't disagree with anything that he said. Good. Anyone else? Come up to the microphone, sir. But I have one quick minute. I would like to point out to that a lot of these poles are located uh, right on top of a two-foot square marker that's already in the ground. And sometimes they have these markers, one and then one next to each other. And here it is, three six-foot poles within, within five feet of each mm -hmm. other. So I, I know that would eliminate a lot of problems because there are already markers in the road. So I think if, Mr. if Andy Holmes over there wants to take a look at this, I think a lot of these can be eliminated. Thank you, Mr. Stevenson. You're welcome. Thank you. Would you like to comment? I don't need to, but I want to second Commissioner Barfield there. They are ugly, and we just really have to do something about that. So it's got my vote. Okay, I want to weigh in because Mr. Stevenson contacted my office and my reaction when um, Mr. Woodard, my chief aide, came to me with this and some pictures, my reaction was pretty much the same as Commissioner Barfield's. And I thought, what? And, but the more I looked into it, uh, I thought, wow, this guy's got a, a genuine complaint here. And then I started driving around and I was appalled and astounded with the amount of these things that I pass on a daily basis and never paid attention. But you're absolutely correct. And then I spoke to Mr. Denninghoff and he said we can eliminate this problem and so we're going to do it. So we have a motion on the floor and we have a second and staff has received direction. So anyone wish to vote no on this? Can we be a little more specific uh, direction to eliminate the polls? Well, Sorry. well, Mr. Barfield, go ahead. You, you, um, you. What I'd like for him is to look, uh, work with the utilities companies that do this and come up with a solution. And that solution will be some sort of permitting or some kind of approval process and bring it back to us. And if there is pushback where they, the utilities companies will not do that, then we're going to come up with our own rules. We already have our own rules. Okay. Is it, Commissioner, is, is it fair to assume that you want us to find a way to minimize the number of these Absolutely. in the right of way? And actually the, the size of them, because I understand there has to be some, because I understand the purpose of them, but some of these six foot tall, it makes absolutely no sense. Mr. Denninghoff, would you like to weigh in on that? <laughs> uh, I will carefully <laughs> weigh in on it. Uh, commissioners, I, uh, the, the principal purpose of these polls is to try to identify the location of a uh, utilities uh, facilities that are underground. And uh, the, uh, they're not there for a safety purpose in the sense of, of uh, protecting people who are driving on the roadway. Uh, in the case of 
power lines and and underground power lines and underground gas mains, there is a safety element associated with that. Um, as Mr. Stevenson has pointed out, the vast majority of these are associated with AT&T, which are neither electric nor uh, gas lines. And uh, they do create a problem for maintenance purposes. They are obviously an aesthetic issue, as has already been expressed. And uh, so I think minimizing them is probably in a, uh, a minimal, minimum goal. Uh, the, um, uh, I, I think the protection of fiber optic lines, particularly associated with traffic control devices, is, is an important uh, thing, which is also a safety issue to have the traffic system working properly. Uh, and, but that is not what we're talking about here in these cases. So uh, I, I am encouraged by the idea that the board would give us some direction on this. I think what we should probably do is come back with some sort of a report to the board uh, that uh, uh, gives you an idea as to what our status is. If we're getting uh, resistance that seems to be um, excessive uh, or, or causing a lack of progress, I think we want to report that to the board and let you know. If we think we're getting someplace that's positive, then we can also do that. And uh, I would think that uh, we could probably do that within about two months or so. Uh, in the meantime, I think you might give us direction not to issue permits regarding uh, installing any further of these. And uh, so, in effect, because uh, we're not under, under we're under no requirement under the law to and to allow them to be installed. So, I think that, uh, or the, that I'm aware of at least. And so, I think uh, that would sort of put the stops on it and allow us to try to get it under control in an orderly and reasonable fashion. So, Mr. Barfield, would you consider um, requiring uh, an immediate halt to permitting on yes, these things? Yes, add that in addition, uh, there will be an immediate halt to issuing any further permits for markers. I'll just interject one more thought. It just seems to me, having researched this a little bit, speaking with county staff, that it appears to me that it, it's a practice that probably was never authorized by any supervisor in the AT&T world. It's just guys and girls out on the job getting lazy and sticking them in the ground. So I think we're on the right track and we'll get it taken care of and thank you so much. We good? Okay, so yes. So we have a motion and a second. Uh, anyone wish to vote no? Pass is 4 0. Thank you. Okay, F3. I'm going to make a, make a, I'm going to take this off the agenda because um, the mayor of Palm Shores and her county attorney contacted my office and I contacted Scott Knox and they've assured us that they are going to pay in full the $101,000 to the county over a 90 day period and if that's acceptable to the board then we can put that behind us and, and move on. And, they're also dissolving their CRA. and they are dissolving their CRA, correct. Comments? Yes. First of all, I believe you need a moat. This, this, I was put on the agenda by my office. Right. My office was the one that did the work. So I don't think you unilaterally can remove something from the uh, agenda. I think you can make a motion to remove something from the agenda, but I don't think you have the unilateral ability to do that. Second, on top of that, um, I, when my office did the investigation and found this out, we asked for the taxpayers to be held uh, neutral on this. Uh, in the proposal from Palm Shores, no, uh, no interest was imputed. County interest is 1.14. That would amount to slightly over $3,000, 3082 since 2010 to be exact. If the court was to make a judgment, uh, they set standards, that would be 5.17%. 
So uh, I, I, cer I certainly think this is worth a little bit of discussion. I know I understand why you know you know Palm Shores would probably want to. Uh, put this under the rug, but the reality of the situation, you have a person that was responsible for taxpayer funds act in a, in a manner that was inappropriate, and though the county has no ability, I certainly as a county commissioner, I hope this board would come together, and instead of levying that $100,000 on the town of Palm Shores, I would ask the may personally, and I hope the board would back me up here to ask the mayor to repay the hundred and one thousand plus three thousand eighty two dollars to cover the amount that she says was a mistake i 'll give her the benefit of the doubt and uh, accept the fact that this was a mistake, um, but you rectify that mistake, and how you rectify that mistake is you pay the amount of money instead of putting that on the eight or nine hundred uh, residents of that town. To put this in perspective, this is about 11 percent of the entire budget of Palm Shores. And I know we're not in charge of the budget of Palm Shores, but that would be a, well, our budget's a little over a billion dollars, so that would be a hundred million dollar fine that was being levied on the taxpayers of Brevard County if it was willful negligence or at least a mistake on any one of us county commissioners. So, uh, you know, I would ask, or I would ask that it not be removed so we could discuss at least at a minimum adding in the interest uh, that the county taxpayers had to pay on this to the $101,000 that Palm Shores is being forced to return uh, to the county taxpayers. Pleasure of the board. Commissioner Barfield. Well, first, it's Palm Shores. All the, it's their responsibility. They're the ones who gave the direction <coughs> to the mayor. And as long as we get the money back, it doesn't makes no difference if it comes from the mayor or it comes from um, from the town of Palm Shores. And I, I think we have to believe what the uh, what the, the city people tell you. And that's how we have to deal with this. That there was a mistake, and uh, they're rectifying it. So I don't see any issue here. I see we go ahead and accept the money from the Palm Bay Shore, Palm Shores, and uh, then let's move on. Commissioner Pritchett, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. Um, Mr. Knox, I, you sent out two different um, payoffs to us. One went from a four-year amount to a five-year amount, it went up, and that's because there was a statute of limit limitations, but they went ahead and added in that fifth year to try to bring remedy for the full amount, correct? Well, they, they wanted to pay back everything that was went into the CRA that should have been used as CRA money and not paid to the, the mayor. So that included everything back to 2010, which was, I think, approximately 15 or 16,000 more than what they originally had proposed to give you back. So okay. the statute of limitations on an issue like this would have been either four or five years, depending upon what the judge decided he wanted to do with it. Uh, so it means he probably are getting 16 to 19,000 more than you would have gotten, even with a with the uh, well, with the interest would probably have been less than that. But you're still getting more than you would get with even with five percent interest. Not to mention we don't have to pay for attorneys. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you never pay for us too much. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so so. I think they're trying to bring remedy to it, and it's um, it's just it's it's a shame that this happens. And um, I, there had to have been a board that at some time voted to to go ahead and give her a salary for it. So I I just wish we were better at, at doing these, or the attorney had caught it and 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 did it all correctly. But I am relieved that they're able to pay it all back and pay it back quickly, and then we can get it back in our account and start earning interest on the money ourselves. So. Um, I'm probably going to, I, I don't know how we're going to do this, and Commissioner Tobias, I'd appreciate you getting all this information to us, but um, I, I think with what um, Commissioner Barfield just suggested is, is probably the, the, the best path for us to take to, to get the county whole. Commissioner Tobias, you had something else to add? 
No, Mr. Chair. Uh, it, there's certainly no, it doesn't seem like there's board sentiment to uh, fully uh, recoup the funds that, uh, that uh, were taken incorrectly by Palm Shores. And, you know, without three votes, uh, uh, it's a moot point. Okay, well, I, I'll weigh in here. I think, as, as Mr. Knox pointed out, that we're, because they're voluntarily giving up this money, we're getting a, an additional amount of money that we could have recouped through a court of law. So I think we just um, agree to, to do this, move on. But I think it points out the need for CRA oversight, and I would hope that um, moving forward, any future commissioners that put together a CRA take things like this into account and, and make things very, very clear so there are no missteps or, or misunderstandings. And I think that we've made a big step. Um, Mr. Abate has been negotiating with CRAs in the county um, and been getting an awful lot of cooperation from those CRAs, so we should have something to report on that in the next month or so. And so having said that, do we have a motion to um, accept this this offer from the town of Palm Shores to reimburse the county for the $101,000? Mr. Chairman, there is a proposed interlocal agreement which you have distributed to you, which doesn't reflect the 30-day payoff, but that will be modified to reflect 90 days, that. 90 days. Well, this they, they, they've this? downed it to 30. Okay. They have? Okay. Yeah. Very so, good. if you would uh, move, so it's to a moving target. I know. Well, it's getting lower, you know, lower and lower and well, lower. Let's wait another week. It might be the next day. <laughs> so, if you could move as part of your motion to to uh, approve the chairman to sign that interlocal, would be that'd be appreciated. Okay. So, one of you has to make this motion. Okay. Okay. I will say it. Uh, <laughs> That's what I was thinking. <laughs> Okay, I make a motion to accept the interlocal agreement that the uh, the amount of funds, it's 101,000 roughly, 902, will be paid within 30 days by Palm Shores back to Bard County. Right. Very good, I second. Okay, we have a motion on the table and a second. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Passes 3-1. Moving on to F4. Board consideration regarding to include authority to conduct internal audits and negotiations with community CRAs. Mr. Tobiah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Make no mistake, this CRA issue, Palm Shores, originated and ended, well, clearly didn't end with my office, but uh, it ended with a, a, a board decision. And while I have a very capable and hardworking staff, they don't have an extensive auditing background. And if we were able to find clear violations of statute, um, I certainly would hope that we could look at, hopefully we don't find anything, but I would like to give uh, direction to the county manager as he moves forward uh, to go ahead and put the um, internal audits into the interlocal agreements. Uh, asking the answer that I got back from the county attorney, which I'm sure everyone got here, it looks as though we may, but it's not black and white. So. Um, I certainly would like uh, us to have the ability uh, to go ahead and do that as we move forward. Um, and I, I, I think uh, the Palm Shores uh, example of, of the CRA's blatant mismanagement is probably an indication that we do need to do a better job uh, overseeing these uh, agencies. And since we don't necessarily in the office have that, I, I think that we would look for an independent outside um, source to do that. And I imagine these CRAs would strongly be in favor of this because if they are keeping their books in uh, good order, I think they would be very proud of having someone come in and look at that. So that is the reason I brought it to uh, to the board's attention. 
Do you have a card on this, Ms. Pam LaSalle? Pam LaSalle Vieira. I'd like to make an appeal to uh, have the board consider um, creating an inspector general's office. I made this appeal to the prior board and seemed to think there was no problem, but apparently this problem with the uh, pay of the mayor of the CRA in Palm Shores had been going on for several years, and yet, you know, we, we have no problem, so we don't need an IG. <laughs> Now, an IG could help with several things that have been on the agenda tonight. An IG, well, first of all, for those who may um, not know, <laughs> uh, I've, I've been living and breathing this subject for over a year now because uh, I made the uh, request of the Charter Review Commission uh, prior to putting it before the board in May of last year. But an Inspector General Office uh, would provide independent oversight. They are an office that's created and insulated from other uh, influences within the government structure. Um, other counties in Florida have them. Uh, there are five counties that have them, uh, the smallest being, and the one with the smallest budget being in Duval. And their budget's about 800000 a year for an IG. Their population is about the same, but an IG could cover and provide uh, oversight for contracts. Um, they are an independent watchdog that um, has uh, a hotline where they can have informants give them information. Uh, they, uh, the, the Broward uh, IG office covers CRAs. Uh, the Palm Beach uh, office covers their school board as well. The uh, Duval uh, IG office covers pretty much everything in that county. And they had a commissioner push um, creating that office there because he felt like his office couldn't do all the in-depth work and be able to stand on top of all issues, uh, much like what apparently Commissioner Tobias has been doing uh, in uncovering problems with contracts and problems with the CRAs. Um, but anyway, um, I, I think uh, just tonight, on tonight's agenda, uh, the problem we had with a, uh, the uh, solid waste contract, that would be appropriate for an IG to be involved with. Uh, ethics, if you're concerned about uh, criminal backgrounds and uh, to get an IG, you have to pass ethics regulation. This is an in-depth um, situation and a proposal that I can't explain and sell in five minutes. What I need is someone on this board to embrace this idea and get it to be developed further. But, um, and obviously the problem with the CRA. Uh, but, you know, this county has hundreds of millions of dollars in contracts uh, that are ongoing. That, you know, how much money is being mishandled uh, whether uh, innocently or through malfeasance, we don't know. So uh, again, I'm making an appeal to have you consider installing an inspector general. Uh, you know, if you look at if you look at the back in April, uh, you had over 600 pages of internal audits on the CRAs. There wasn't a word in there about salaries for the mayor out of the CRA funds. So I, I don't know how you found it. I guess you got, got it through public records or maybe someone called your office and told you about it. But um, uh, I don't have a staff. I don't get paid to do this job. Uh, and uh, so it, and I don't know, y'all are aware, but the public may not be aware that getting public records is not uh, free. You know, there can be, uh, depending on how much you need, there could be in-depth costs. And I will address the other issue because the, the prior speaker was concerned about it. Um, I think that there's some kind of uh, language issue going on with the website as far as the agendas are concerned. Uh, I don't, I got the, a disc from Sally because I was wanting those that, um, a packet from April where it you had all the seconds. CRAs. I think, you're, I think I'm giving you some information here. I'm not making a public statement. 
Um, anyway, I think it's a language thing because I had to dig out one of my old computers for the disk to work on. And it was random spots. It looked like it, something had been redacted. But yeah, I, I, think it, I think it's some kind. Somebody needs to talk to somebody <laughs> to figure out what's going on. Because it didn't used to happen. It's all of a sudden started happening. Pam, I have a question for you. The, you said it was $850,000. Was that the correct number? Did I get that right? For With, what? For uh, an Auditor General for Duval No, County? I think the last time I looked at their budget, it was around $800,000. Okay. And their budget um, uh, covers all the, everything in the county, the school, the, all the constitutional officers. Uh, and the reason I look at those counties is because they're also a charter county. So it's you know kind of trying to compare apples mm -hmm. to apples, even though they are kind of an unusual. Um, they're they're a council, not a board of county commissioners. So, but I think it's very affordable. I have not looked at a single one that did not more than pay for themselves, and they are they're the, they have to 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 find stuff, or otherwise they become obsolete. The advantage you have. If, if this board installed it, the advantage you have is you can eliminate it. If, if, if I could ever get it to referendum to remove it, it has to go to referendum again. So uh, you can do it. Uh, I, think, I think it would, if, if, if I were sitting up there, it would be a load of work off of me and my staff because you would have this specialized insulated department that is truly independent. And it, it would give people confidence in their government. Thank I really you. believe that. Thank you. Sure. Commissioner Pritchett, you have the floor. Yeah. Um, on this subject, I, any good business should welcome an internal audit. It helps wake you up and, and get everything to where you, where you should be and help you catch a hold of problems before you go through an actual audit. So my, I got a couple of questions here. Mr. Knox, are we able to do internal audits on, on CRAs right now? Uh, you can do performance audits on them. Okay, so then my question would be, do we have any consistency that we do these audits on, on the CRAs that we're funding? Can I, can I address that? Yes, sir. Because Mr. Sal brought up a good point, which is that the audits that we do receive from the CRAs don't really point these things out. Um, and Commissioner Tobias has rightly pointed out that uh, we should shine a light on the issue as to whether they are complying with the state law. Um, what happened, as I see it, is back in whenever the board decided to delegate all this authority to the municipalities, they gave all the authority to the municipalities to, to create CRAs, to monitor the uh, state, you know, delegate authority to the CRAs, whatever that, that was all given to the municipalities. So in, a set, in essence, what the board did was transfer the, its charter authority over CRAs to cities, and cities are responsible for making sure the CRAs do what they're supposed to do, S especially cases where the, the city council becomes the CRA board. The state law that allows that situation to take place with the counties transferring their authority also requires every CRA to submit an audit at the end of the year. And after talking with some of the auditors who do that kind of stuff, it's clear that they're supposed to look for compliance with state law. Uh, none, of the, none of the audits that we've seen have ever mentioned anything about a violation of state law. So there's also an issue with the auditing that's going on. I think shining a light on that issue, as Commissioner Dubai has uh, brought up, is probably the best way to do that, since uh, it's clear that the, the CRA in cities who are doing these audits are not focusing on that issue. And I think uh, his, his direction, or if the board is to do it, to, to the county manager to negotiate a provision that actually provides a light on that particular issue would be helpful in that regard. Okay, I, I'm still learning in the county what we do. When I served on um, Titusville, we would do an internal audit and external audit on the CRA. And the internal audit came back one time, there's uh, like, Two hundred dollars that wasn't transferred correctly. We immediately brought remedy to that. So when they came in and did the regular audit, but I'm guessing what you're saying 
is there is that not those types of control over all the CRAs? It, what what the, the statute requires you to do certain kinds of things when you're looking at the audit. Okay, and, if, and looking at the audits and reading them, you see that the auditors explain what they're supposed to be doing, and they will look for compliance or supposed to be looking for compliance with state laws, but they don't do it and render any opinions on it. Okay. So that's where the, the, the disconnect, I think, is coming, because they don't do that kind of meticulous audit that you're talking about. Are they not having legal opinion? Like we had our, our city attorney that would constantly give us legal opinion, what you can and can't do. Is, do you think there, that's part of it? Or? Yeah, well, typically in the past, when we've had internal audits, say for the county, uh -huh. they will audit a, dep a department, for that say. They'll audit the uh, parks department. If there's an issue that they spot that seems to be out of sorts with the law, they come in and they talk to us and say, is this something that they're supposed to be doing or is it not? You know, I don't know if that's going on in the cities or not, but apparently it doesn't because it, it doesn't show up in the audits. Okay. Commissioner Barfield. So let me, there's too many things you were saying they, and I'm not sure who was they. So the, uh, and I'm kind of slow right now, it's late and my foot hurts, so. Um, so when the audits, the CREs do their audits, it's the, uh, they, you're, what you're saying is their audits need to reflect the Florida statutes and regulations. They're, they're, the auditors that do the audits for the CRAs are supposed to be looking for, at least in their, in their opinion, they're supposed mm -hmm. to be looking for compliance issues, but they don't spend the time that they normally do for an internal audit because it's not, the, the audit requirements of the statute are, yeah, that applies to CRAs are not as as complex and as inclusive as the, uh, the actual audit process would normally be. So they do say they look they look for those things. If they see them, they'll say something about them. But most of the, virtually all the ones I've seen, all the audits I've seen from the CRAs don't say anything but there's nothing to report and we don't have an opinion about it. Okay, so what you're saying is we need to include this in our interlocal agreements right. to get that clarified. Now, right. what, when we're talking about internal auditors, are we talking about we're validating those audits or are we? Well, the internal audits is done by an independent auditor of the internal processes of the organization they're auditing. Okay, so it's not the county putting out another audit. No, we have, actually okay. what we're going to try to do, I think, unless I'm, unless I'm misunderstanding Commissioner Tobias, is try to get the interlocal agreement to say they're going to have to do this okay. through an independent That's where auditor. I was going. That's where I was going. Would that be the clerk? Well, the clerk also has the authority to do this because the county's money is going to, to fund these CRAs, and he has done that in the past for several of them. Uh, whether he's going to continue to do it or not, I certainly if we require the CRAs to do it like they're supposed to be doing under state law, that should be the way it's done, I think. And I think the the interlocal forcing them to concentrate on compliance with the law and making sure things are being properly spent is the way to go with that. Are we prepared to make a decision tonight on something like this or do we want to think about it until the next meeting? I, I think we need to go ahead and do something. I think we can go ahead and direct the county manager to uh, include in the interlocal work with the city, the CRAs to include in the interlocal agreements uh, uh, a definition on the audits to meet the uh, state statutes. I think Mr. Knox can give you some words on that. I guess I'll make that a motion. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Second. 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 And do you guys need any more clarification on that? Are you good? Oh my God. Okay. <laughs> I missed it. Okay, I make a motion uh, for the county manager to, uh, in his negotiations for interlocal agreements, to clarify and include in that interlocal agreements uh, to clarify the audits. The audits would define the uh, state statutes and meet the state statute requirements. Very good. Right. I'm impressed. Thank you. And your, and your toe hurts, too. It hurts. <laughs> Okay, so we have that motion on the floor. Do we have a second? Second. We have a second by Commissioner Pritchett. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4-0. And I would like for the board to consider and, and investigate an auditor general position, uh, pros and cons. I think it's something that's worthwhile for us to consider. Well, Mr. Chair, can, can we look at potentially having a workshop to find out where sure. funding sources would be, sure. how other counties I think, have... I think first we need to just 
look at those items on a person by person, commissioner by commissioner basis. And if we think there's a reason to go forward, let's go forward and have a workshop. Okay, public comments. Donald David Henry. Thank you for your patience, sir. You have the patience of Job. Well, this is my first time up here, so uh, thank you for having me, gentlemen. And gentlemen, ma'am. David Henry from uh, Melbourne, Florida. I represent the Father's Rights Movement, Brevard County Branch Satellite. Uh, the, I take my direction from the national group. Uh, the president is a Thomas Fiddler out of Alaska. Uh, the inf information I want to provide or inquire about is family law reform and oversight for the Department of Children and Families, the Garden at Lytham, and the State Attorney's Office. And then you have their county entities, which are Empower and uh, Children's Home Society. I think the contract was just lost by Empower, and now it's Family Allies. Uh, I want to second or support Ms. LaSalle's uh, motion, I think it was, for a idea. Our idea for a county inspector general. And even goes far to say as well as having an ombuds ombudsman? Is that ombudsman. Not it? Yeah. I think that would be a good idea. Uh, DCF has an inspector general. Uh, it, look, it seems to me that the one hand washes the other. And then when you escal escalate and go up higher, you have a state IG, and the same thing happens there. You reach out to your, to your elected official offices, like the Attorney General and things of that nature, with any complaints. And it's kind of like you get the same responses. I think here locally, at a grassroots level, you probably get more response, more support here locally with any issues. Kind of a hometown feel. Uh, on prior service, Army. Um, a student at Eastern Florida State College. I'm trying to be an attorney. Um, You're doing a good job. Thank you, sir. I'm a little nervous. In Manatee County, we had a member named Glenn Ghibellina. Uh, in 2016 of April, he passed a resolution for Parental Alienation uh, Month, which would be recognized as a form of abuse from either, either parent. I am a childhood victim, adult survivor of it, and I'm experiencing it now as an adult, uh, as a father. Uh, I, past advocacy I've been a part of was with the Father's Rights Movement, and uh, you might have heard of Senate Bill 668. Uh, previously, I think it was approximately 2015, uh, Rick Scott vetoed despite the majority vote of the House and the Senate and the Florida popular vote. You have 30 seconds. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, that's what I wanted to present to you all. And if there's any uh, medium that constituents can reach out to our county commission when we have complaints or concerns and maybe receive some support from our elected officials, that's all I have. Thank you. Thank you. Moving into board reports, Mr. Abate. No reports. Mr. Knox. Mr. Chairman, I've been asked to uh, bring a matter before the board for uh, direction. Uh, the Natural Resources Department and uh, the attorneys representing them from our office have been apprised of the fact that uh, the city, uh, I'm sorry, Pinellas County is applying for a declaratory statement in, at the Department of Environmental Protection in the state of Florida. Uh, relating to um, the abandonment of retention ponds by homeowners associations who think it's uh, appropriate for the county to take over those uh, f facilities once that they abandon them. So uh, Pinellas County didn't like that, and I think that there's some sort of court decision that came out saying uh, that that's what may be on the horizon. So the, the Pinellas County decided to go to DEP and see if they would uh, uh, interpret their permitting rules as requiring somebody other than the county to take over those kinds of things. And uh, the, the Natural Resources Department is looking for a support letter from the county to uh, support Pinellas County in their effort to do that. 
Sounds worthwhile to me. I think it's something that we should consider. Do you want to compose a letter to bring to the next uh, meeting? We certainly could do that. And then we can go from there. Okay, excellent. Commissioner Barfield. Uh, Thursday, I have my uh, first meeting of the uh, Central Florida Expressway Authority, and I got briefed uh, today on that, so I'll let you all know how that goes. Excellent. Commissioner Tobiah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I've got a couple things here. I, we're dealing with the, uh, we'll be dealing with millage rates, I understand, at the next, uh, at the next meeting. Um, there's been a couple comments as to uh, us not having um, a spending problem. We may have a revenue problem. So uh, I'd like to remind the board of uh, Mr. Denninghoff's comment that if we are to look at the uh, gas tax increase, um, that we can do that prior to October 1 if we are going to uh, impose that. So, or, or look at potentially imposing that. So I certainly wanted to, you know, bring that um, back, and I appreciate Mr. Denninghoff doing that. Um, and a second thing, and I don't know that we have uh, personal privilege here, but I certainly would like to uh, ask for uh, a moment of silence. We certainly had a, a statesman in Brevard County uh, pass away. Uh, Bill Ellis, on July 4th of all days, passed away. Uh, at age 81. He'd been here 25 years. I think we'd all had some dealing with him one way or another, and he always had a smile on his face. And uh, I'll tell you what, I saw the man three or four times with, I guess, his grandson at, or, or grand, uh, grandkids, actually, at Burger 21. And, I, you know, I'd never seen a, a guy so happy as he, as he was cutting up, uh, cutting up food. So I didn't even stop, but I, I just l loved how happy he was uh, there. He, he's worked for Florida Power and Light, and uh, I've spoken with a number of people that said he was not only a friend, but he was a mentor. And uh, what I would like to do is ask, uh, since I don't have too much luck with resolutions, my office has put together uh, a resolution, um, and I would like to see, I, I guess my office has spoke with his widow. Um, there are some transportation issues, and w would like to present that, or, or I would like the chairman or someone else to, to present that as we come forward. I've, I've collected that, and, and uh, Susan Hammerling, it was really close, uh, close with him and, and did the research. So um, what I will do is shift that over to the county attorney's uh, office and to avoid all sunshine, because technically we do vote on resolutions. Um, you know, I, I'd like someone else to, certainly, to certainly carry that. But if we could have just a, a moment of silence for a wonderful uh, Brevard County resident, uh, Bill Ellis. Sure, we can do that. Please bow your heads and for a moment of silence. Thank you. And thank you for bringing that up. I was, that was part of my board report. I'm sorry. That's okay. He, he deserves all the attention he can get, and his, and his wonderful wife, Carol. Are you finished? Yes, yes. Okay. Sorry, Commissioner Isnardi. Oh. oh. <laughs> Call me anything but late for dinner. <laughs> okay, I, let's try Pritchett. <laughs> I want to um, bring something up for discussion. I'm reading, I'm reading my list here. Okay. <laughs> they, uh, we just got through with the 4th of July celebration, and I, I know this is a topic about fireworks, but it's escalating. There were so many missiles being fired at that time. I, I was wondering where you guys are, maybe figuring something out, because it's really becoming the Wild West out there. And I, and I talked to the sheriff, and he said he just doesn't even know how to regulate it because of all the things that we sell. So I was just hoping you guys maybe spend some time, consider some ideas, because it's getting pretty dangerous. I mean, in the middle of your street and your residence, there's firework missiles being shot. And, and I, I think I would hate to see someone get hurt or someone's house burnt down. I mean, it's celebration, I get it. But, the, I mean, they've gone from little bitty things now to big old huge things. It's like a regular firework going off in the middle of your street. So um, I thought this might be something we could discuss on how to protect our community a little. You come up with some ideas and I'll listen. 
Bef before right. you go off on a discussion, you better have me take a look at whether you're, you're preempted from doing anything about it by oh. the state law. Okay. So I, I know that in the past they have had preemptions, so I don't know if they're still there or not, but I'll take a look at it. Mr. Knox, if you would look and see if there's anything that would hinder us from having a discussion, that would be great. All right. So I'll finish up here and... Um, Mr. Bonte. If I may, um, I believe Natural Resources has an issue related to that letter that uh, they need to bring up and oh, bring okay. to the board's attention. Yeah, it's the comments are due by tomorrow. So um, uh, Christine Valliere has already drafted a letter for us to support Pinellas' request to DEP on the HOA stormwater issue. We just need your authority to send the letter, if you're okay with that. Okay, well, let's have a motion to that effect. Do we have a letter that we can look at? Um, we can get it to you electronically, I believe. Uh, we, I received it during the meeting and reviewed it uh, myself. And uh, the, I think it's a very good letter, by the way, but uh, we'd have to get it electronically to you. I, I, I don't know any other way to do it. It's a two-page letter. Can we just give the authority to uh, the chairman? Do yes, that. you can do that. Okay. Uh, make a motion. We, we uh, give the authority to the chairman to read the letter if it's appropriate, sign it, and send it. A second. Okay, we have a motion and a second for me to sign a letter. Yeah. <laughs> make sure it's the right letter. And make sure it's the right letter and gets the job done. <laughs> All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Passes 4 0. Okay, my board report. Mr. Tobias covered it pretty much, but I just wanted to make, make sure everybody was aware that a really terrific person in the Brevard County passed away. He was always a joy to meet. He always had a smile on his face and uh, was very, very knowledgeable of what goes on in Brevard County. So he'll, he'll be greatly missed. Very nice. With that, this meeting is adjourned. The opinions expressed by any member of the public during any period of public comment do not necessarily reflect the views or opinions of the Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, or the program sponsor, and are solely those of the presenter. The Board of County Commissioners of Brevard County, Florida, Space Coast Government Television, and the program sponsor hereby expressly disclaim any and all responsibility or liability for any defamatory or slanderous statements expressed by any member of the public during any such period.